Assessment Priorities Committee for the City of Lloydminster to order for Monday, November 18th. This time we'll take a silent moment of personal reflection. <coughs> As a reminder, all members of the council are obligated to declare a conflict of interest or a pecuniary interest as per section 133 of the Mr. Charter regarding any item on this agenda. This meeting is for discussion and information gathering only. All decisions will occur during regular council meetings. We thank all our presenters at this time for their time. Moving on to the agenda, item number two, approval of the agenda of the direction of the council. Council Member Mitchell. With the agenda dated November 18th, 2019, be approved. Senator. Councilor Fagan. Is there any question before I call for a question? Not seeing any. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Moving on to agenda item number three, looking for direction of council regarding the approval of the previous meeting minutes. Councilor Fagan. The Governance and Priorities Committee minutes dated November 12th, 2019, be approved. Senator. Councilor Monroe. Any further questions on those minutes? Not seeing any, I'll call for the question. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Moving on to item number four, administration reports to the city manager. Good afternoon, Your Worship and Council. To present 4.1, Lord Minister Cultural and Science Center, Building Infrastructure and Functional Spatial Needs Study, I'll ask you all to turn up. Good afternoon, Your Worship. Council. Good afternoon, Mr. Uh, today, I'm here to speak to you about the Lloyd Minister Culture Science Center and Construction and Spatial Needs Assessment. Uh, this was publicly tendered. Uh, the Lloyd Minister Culture Science Center and Construction and Spatial Needs Assessment with the goal uh, to conduct a building assessment, prepare a spatial needs report, uh, include recommendations for current and new exhibits, and develop a high level concept designs with price estimates. Contract was awarded to Cornerstone Planning Group in the spring of 2018. Assessment started shortly after the contract was awarded. It included a physical assessment of the building, assessment of the display, as well as stakeholder and staff consultation. Summary and key findings in the report identified that the facility is at the end of its useful life. The LCSE requires significant functional, spatial, and aesthetic upgrades, failing building envelope, insufficient environmentally controlled spaces, awkward building layout, Sub-optimal collection adjacencies, limited and sub-optimal programming spaces, higher and outdated exhibits, inconsistent themes, underutilized collection. Along with several recommendations on the display of LCSC and how much space is needed, the report provides high-level options for consideration to replace the LCSC. This includes constructing a new building, a box style or a prefabricated build, or demolish and renovate usable spaces and incorporate prefabricated additions along with the estimated cost ranging from $12.9 million to $18.4 million. The information assembled in the report was used as a reference in the City Community Facilities 2019 Building Report presented to Council during the regular Council meeting on October 28, 2019. Uh, the objective object today was to present the report and ensure that it's released. Uh, your options. Committee accepts the Lloyd Minister Culture and Science Center and Construction and Spatial Needs Assessment and information. And two, the committee requests administration to bring further information to an upcoming governance and priority committee. Thank you, Chair. Questions or comments? Councilor Bunning. Thank you, Worship. I think it's not one of those key, key community pieces we've been talking about around the uh, building assessments and everything we have to do going forward. And all of them come with a very large price tag. We talked about hockey rates, we talked about our cultural and science piece of our community. These are all important, important things. So the one thing that I would say is that 
I'm really looking forward to the community engagement pieces on all of these things, which start December 3rd. Um, I would just continually remind people that we want the input, we need the input as to what we think we should do uh, going forward. These are not small ticket items, and they're all things that are important to the fabric of our communities. So uh, I would just encourage people to, to engage and uh, pay attention to these things and, and help to guide the, the future of these major facility upgrades we need to undertake in the next short period of time. Thank you, Councilor. Questions? Councilor uh, Torsen. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just comment from the report, just generally, like uh, some of the key items that we're listing, I, you know, I agree that those are all present in, in all issues that need to be addressed in a new building or in whatever we intend to do with the renovations, but, you know, as far as <coughs> the building reports telling us as far as failing the building envelope. It's, it's things like that that are coming with the really, really big price tags and also the HVAC systems and things like that that I think are you know, are really important to, to just note on the whole because some of those other things are kind of maybe considered preferences as far as what types of things are in there or maybe the size, shape, dimension of a room, whatever the case is. So there may be some element of preference and things like that, but things like building envelope, failing HVAC system, those are kind of more, to me, hard-hitting dollar number issues where um, we have to address this. Those other things in terms of preference, it could be, could you live along with what you've got if it was merely awkward building layout? Yeah, possibly. Uh, but failing building envelope and things like the HVAC system, those are things that you, you can't, uh, can't just kick down the road. Those are things where that building, more parts of it, may require demolition in the not so distant future. If you don't fix those items up or you know go forward with a plan for replacement. So I just thought they were you know important to note that you know we acknowledge a lot of people talk about wants and needs and uh, you know, this becomes a need based on how, how many of the systems within that building are at a failure point. Right? Subjective nature of where things should be or what a more optimal space would be. So, uh, that, that's all I really have for, for comments. And, and other than that, I, I just think that you know, we're at an awkward spot um, as far as you know financial issues go within the city because we're trying to do all the right things in terms of building reserves and getting to a point where we can start thinking about the future. Uh, but then you also have infrastructure deficits in various areas of the city that we have to now address. So. It's going to be a challenge and going to take us a lot of consideration as to what we end up going with in terms of renovating existing space, find, finding something else that works in the meantime, or you know, demolition and building new, whatever we end up going with. It's just going to be an awkward kind of phase that we're in right now, and especially with the way um, some people would look at it as, as something that's more of a want. But um, I know in my experience in meeting with residents in the year voice type nights and when we do jelly bean surveys, you wouldn't believe the number of jelly beans that go into arts and culture related items every time I'm standing there. Uh, especially with kids, they really care about that stuff and, and value it. So you know, we want to continue to be a place that attracts young residents and young families and, and really people of all ages who could be doing things you know, at every stage of life, having good cultural and uh, <coughs> Programming like that is just as important as having, you know, nice rings and lots of ice time. So, thank you. Close question. Yes, sir. Let me write. Sorry. Yeah, no, get this man some water quick. Uh, no, thank you for the report. I think, you know, there are several things on that. Oh, uh, I think a couple things that uh, Council Dorsen said is that one is I think uh, there's been a acknowledgement. Uh, indirectly and directly that you know, the Lloydminster Cultural Science Centre plays an important role in our community. I know his worship, and I think Jonathan might have been with us when we were doing a tour of the building and there was a family that stopped in from Eastern Canada and was uh, very interested in what it had to offer. And uh, I'm aware of some of the programs, when kids went through there to programs, so it, it has an important role in our community. Um, the other reality in all of this is that we've had a lot of conversations about buildings where uh, spending good money after that, and you look at the cost of the building and what it's actually worth. Uh, if we're to bring this building up to the condition that it needs to be in order to sustain 
uh, within the standards, the Imhoff uh, paint collection and all the other pieces there, uh, the money is just, you know, it exceeds that value of the building to such an extent that all you're doing is buying a good HVAC unit and putting it onto a whole building. And you're buying a good piece here and adding it onto a whole building, which is not sustainable. And this is one of the many examples I think we're, we're encountering on uh, this whole building deficit, infrastructure deficit that we had. So um, I, I think, you know, certainly as we go forward, we need to find the right option that works, uh, not only for the community, but also our, our bank in uh, order for us to be sustainable. Good comments. Um, I'd certainly echo several of the comments around this table from the perspective of the other uh, Lloyd Culture and Science Center serves so many diverse groups in our community. There's so many pieces behind the building of that building, the grounds, and I think that's what's important to ensure that, and I appreciate the your voice name coming up so that people have a chance to discuss that, and we had some discussions already as led into this consultant's report. I had a chance to attend a meeting with a good representative sampling of people that have an interest in that facility, and they're broad, and that's, that's great. We have a lot of support within the community for um, the arts, the culture, Story, historical factors, the oil and gas industry that plays a part. There's a piece, the bar calls set us up on this whole thing. So I think there's so many pieces to that puzzle, and I think that's what we're going to need to do is engage the community to get a full understanding of what they're expecting and help them realize the cost. And at the end of the day, this council or the council that follows will have to make a decision on how we move forward. And that, at the end of the day, is the cost factor. We know that's the, where the buck stops. But from that perspective, but, Joel, if you can clarify two terms for me, and I apologize, I didn't get a chance to look them up for the actual definition, but I just want to make sure I can explain them to somebody that asks me. Spatial, uh, needs assessment. Spatial. 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 Oh, spatial, okay. Spatial needs assessment, so it's really space, right? That's, exactly. That's what that fits, okay. And then the sum, optimum collections, adjacencies. Adjacencies. So, just where the collection is, relevant to the building. So it kind of goes with the awkward, okay. um, awkward display or awkward layout of the building in general. Great, thank you. Because I think those are all things, you know, because it's so funny, the views from the folks that work at the, uh, the facility every day, to the one-offs, because I had family visit and they said, boy, you've got a beautiful facility. And I'm like, well, I'm glad to hear that. They impressed with the, with the display. But their first time through, and then I looked to Councillor Torson, who's told us that some things haven't changed in the awful long in a period of time. I won't say an awful long time since the next to remind us how young he is, but it hasn't changed a lot. So I think it's always the guys in the country and uh, I appreciate what you've brought forward and the staff and the work that the, the, the folks over there do every day. Please carry that message back to the to the team because they're wondering where they fit and they've watched their buildings shrink when the uh, original original Washington buildings came down. Due to the condition again. I think we've talked about that as well. We continue to add on, but to we deal with it. So I think uh, we will be able to hopefully give some direction in due time. Anyone else have any comments? Ms. Baker. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, the Fort uh, Collins Museum has been there for many, many, many years. I don't know when it was started. And it's certainly a, a soft spot in the hearts to many in the area, but one thing about museums, they keep growing. You know, we had 15 plums that all looked the same in there a few years ago, identical. 15 plums, 20. And the question is the management of it, and I know that there's been some great strides made on inventory control and what we're stocking and doing all this stuff, and that's much appreciated because the numbers are growing and uh, the problem will just get worse. Um, somehow, if we can keep the museum alive, we call it a cultural center now. I'm not sure the real definition of cultural center, but we have art galleries in there, we have meeting rooms, we have, and it's really got nothing to do with a museum, in my opinion. The museum's a museum, and uh, the existing facility, uh, as it exists, the Fuchs building 
if I may ask, mention that first, has been there for 70, 80 years, I would think. I forget it's in the report. But it's back in the 50s for sure. Um, and I'm sure it's wiped out many times already. Whether the Fuchs uh, displays are still uh, viable and able to maintain them, that's another story. That's for the experts to worry about and figure out. But the main building, I asked a question. Uh, we talked about the $15 million. Well, financially, we know that we're faced with a wastewater treatment plant, big, big issue big issue for the city financially. But somehow in my mind, I'm having trouble accepting the fact if we didn't have a major mechanical overhaul required for air conditioning and humidity and all that stuff that the skin of that building could be upgraded and uh, preserved and maybe a different roof system for, uh, for a lot less money. That's if you eliminate the mechanical system. And I think it's important to make sure we have a program, whatever we do, of what we're going to do with the building when it's built. And we need to have that before it's built. So uh, I guess I have a hard time throwing away the fact we're going to tear the building down. It's only about 25 years old. Part of it. Not the Fuchs building, the other part of it. I think it was built in the early 90s. Um, and if there's some way to preserve that for $6 million or $8 million or less, then it means we can't have a humidified art gallery. Well, maybe that's the best we can do. But I think somehow we should try and, if possible, and maybe we need a lot of community help. It was started with community money. Uh, people donating funds to the, the Museum of Richard Arts Foundation and things like that. And if we're going to count strictly on tax dollars to keep it going, it's going to be quite a struggle or the tax bill is going to take quite a hit. So maybe that's something for the public to decide. And uh, maybe we have, and I'd like to say I give the management credit for downsizing uh, the number of items we have. Yeah. I know we've got 50 sewing machines out there if we got one. And uh, I don't know what we need them all for. Uh, somehow I'd like to see us preserve <coughs> excuse me, uh, parts of the museum. <coughs> Thank you, Worship. Um, I, well, something I want a clarification on is if we go ahead with uh, doing the design, what does that do for us in terms of chasing grant money um, for a potential renovation or a new build? Does that change anything? Does that give us a better opportunity? It's my understanding for the grant opportunities that we have looked at is that if, you, if we took our current situation and the current report, we could send it off to the grant agency and they would give us a determination of what types of opportunities that may be available to us for funding if we're on the right track in terms of what our building provides currently and we took our current operation and we heard it if you want to call it that or use some of the, the general ideas. Um, generally if you start a program so if you did if you did drawings as, as you said, any expenses incurred prior to any approvals of uh, funding would not be eligible for that. It doesn't mean you would your project wouldn't be eligible but those uh, the expenses you incurred prior to, for example, drawings, uh, would not be would not be eligible. Unless this uh, unless these grants have different criteria, I've got to go that deep into it, but that's a general idea of how it work. So just to, to clarify, we would be in the same position for tracing or chasing grant money or applying for grants uh, if we just use the uh, report that states the condition of the cultural and science center rather than going through with the spatial needs assessment and all that uh, reports that, that we could be doing uh, or that we're suggesting that we're going to be doing we would be in the same place whether we do one first or the other and then one we could get grant money for it because 
I'm kind of confused as to whether or not we should wait to be applying for grants before we follow through and do the spatial needs assessment, based on what you just said. Yeah. <laughs> just to provide clarity, this report is already completed. It's not attached to the, the admin report because it's over 300 pages. Um, it will be online today. We are going to put it online today, and we do have copies here. And the council is given copies as part of your information package on these stick drives. Um, what city manager was saying is we can use this report, the current report we have, submitted to the uh, grant agencies to determine whether what we're talking about in the report with regards to the space we're requiring. Um, I mean, the, the document talks about three options. Uh, two are rebuilt, completely new. One is renovation. The renovation one is the most expensive out of the three options just due to um, the condition of the existing building. So we can submit this report to the granting agencies to determine whether we have applicable uh, project to apply for those, those grants moving forward. Just to clarify, yeah, my misunderstanding was whether or not you were suggesting we were going to start in the new year moving towards a design phase, but what you're suggesting is we are going to use this document to apply for grants, and this is just more so to make this a public document for you know, regular readers and members of the public to understand where this building is at, and uh, what the possible requirements are going to be from a cost perspective, but we're not there yet, obviously, on landing on where that cost is going to be, but we will be using this in the meantime to <coughs> attempt to apply for grants for the new space. If council gives us that direction, we could take that step, and that's where we'll, we'll be going. So far, we haven't done that based on the building reports, and we're waiting for, once we have all that discussion, if council gives us a direction to do that, then we'll proceed to do that. Councilman Baker, Councilman Baker. I guess the other question I have is that um, Councilman Baker made reference to engaging the community, and this is a little early in the game at this point, but I'm just sort of learning what point in time the potential is there to draw community members in from a fundraising, grant application, whatever it is, and what that might look like, and how far out that might be. Because if we go to a community and say, we want to help, and how soon can we get involved? We should have some sense of, you know, a timeline where we can engage them. Yeah, this building was a part of our uh, buildings committee report that was presented to council uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, that is coming to your voice on December 3rd, and this building will be a part of the engagement and uh, public feedback on on where they want to see the community go from a culture and science center perspective. I, I got that part, I guess, what I'm thinking about is that if, if there are people within the community that see this as uh, they want to champion this project, uh, how do they get involved? When do they get involved? That's kind of a, but ultimately there has to be some direction set here from the council. Uh, but I'm, I'm seeing in what three to six months is probably the soonest that they would have, uh, we'd have information to be able to move on with this. Yeah, I mean, once we have direction on how council wants to proceed, then we can set up those those okay. inquiry lines and, and engage stakeholders through that. Okay. Any other questions? Just, just part of this report as well, and part of the reason we're releasing it today is we did have a quite an extensive uh, stakeholder engagement process, and we want to make sure that that was closed in terms of the, the feedback that they provided and, and the report that, that was driven as a result. So uh, then from there, once the request I have, we will take it to a I guess bring back to council probably early in the new year and say and go for direction on where we want to go. I appreciate that. I think that uh, in the conversations I've had with some of the folks that have an interest, this has been an ongoing discussion for many years. And I hope that this council can set some direction moving forward, at least to give the residents, the interested groups, the people that have got a lot of heart and soul from time to time into that facility and some of the pieces to it, some direction so that they know that council is moving forward with something. But it looks like maybe we will say that this table, maybe the next council, I think we need to have some direction. So as you say, Council Dutch, people that have an interest and passion know where they're going, uh, at least have a direction that uh, the city wants to follow and work with them. And 
to determine who does lead that process exactly because there's there's many pieces to this. And as I said, I've heard it through the community in 15 years. There's a lot of interest. There's been various attempts, and uh, I'm sure that we see us move forward. Uh, Councilor, yeah, I was going to say, I, you know, again, looking further into our, our all of our facilities, and like, I, mean, I, I know that we'll be reaching out to the community or championing, being champions, if you like, uh, some other projects too. So I think it's just uh, us need, needing to stay ahead enough, far enough to have our plans in order so that we can tap into the community to be able to support us. So that's all. And I think this is a good one. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, as the administration pointed out, giving them some direction on grant money, I think there's, we need to turn over every stone. Councilor Baker's mentioned it again, it's not going to come cheap. And uh, I appreciate he's, he's kind of high on the piggy bank. And, you know, there's not the piggy bank we wish we had. And we've got other issues that we have to deal with. We're going to we have to talk about it. It's continuously moving forward. But it's just not going to go away. There's a price tag to it. We're going to be talking about other buildings. And this is the part of the community that we need to ensure that we engage the community. We engage every grant application that we can. can and uh, at the end of the day, we go back to the taxpayers and provide a, a good, solid basis to, to request uh, their support. Any other comments? Thank you very much to us. Moving on to agenda item number 4.2. Oh, this is the end. Thank you, Worship, to present 4.2 Land Exchange Agreement, Husky and City of Westminster. I'll ask Executive Manager Don Stan to present it. Thank you, City Manager. Uh, before you, we have a land exchange agreement uh, between Husky and the City of Westminster. Husky Midstream General Partnership and Husky Oil Operations Limited and the City of Westminster are looking to enter into a land exchange agreement. Husky Midstream General Partnership and Husky Oil Operations Limited have shown interest to enter into a land exchange agreement within, with the City of Westminster. The land exchange agreement will facilitate Husky with their pipeline expansion and in turn secure land for City of Westminster that will provide for future expansion and operable lands located near the City of Westminster's operations. Uh, I'll get into subject lands. Uh, after I present this, I can show you on the map what lands are, are tied to this. There is some attachment to the report that shows the parcels I zoomed in. For the land exchange to move forward, it will be, it will be subject to an agreement being reached between Husky Midstream General Partnership and Husky Oils Operation Limited, as well as a resolution from Council. Some of the terms within the agreement are, are not limited to, but uh, land sales, so what parcels are included by both parties. Uh, there's three parcels on behalf of the city in exchange for one parcel uh, exchange for Husky. The purchase price, uh, just to point out that it is agreed between city administration and Husky that there will be a net zero payment on either party, so the lands are of equal value going both directions. Uh, some of the conditions uh, pursuant to the agreement are obvious Council, City Council approval of the agreement, um, completion of subdivision prior to March 1st, uh, disclosure of all environmental condition assessment and documents related to all parcels, uh, disclosure of all leases currently occupied by both Husky um, clients and City of Windsor leases. Yeah, that's in regards to both parties. Uh, subdivision of lands that the city and Husky operations will split the cost of subdivision 50-50. Um, property tax uh, adjustments, that's regarding um, once the titles are transferred that the, the um, taxes are payable prorated to the date of the um, sale of agreement. Another one to note is off-site levies within the agreement. The city of Lloydminster and Husky have agreed to defer the off-site levy payments until further development occurs on the parcels or further subdivision occurs on the parcels. We've had a lot of conversations with Husky regarding this, this uh, clause within the agreement. We've had a um, significant amount of legal review and from 
the city's perspective and through our legal counsel, the clause that we have is is the best uh, method moving forward. And it gives the opportunity for these parcels to be utilized by both parties upon further development or development agreement or further subdivision. Full offsite levies would be would be due at that time. Easements. So within the agreement, we talk about the city's. Uh, need for an easement on the parcel south of the landfill. Uh, Husky has agreed that they would negotiate a crossing, whether that be a utility crossing for a deep main infrastructure or a road crossing. Um, the agreement speaks to Husky granting that. Um, obviously, we need to work out the details of um, cover depth and those types of things to protect both their assets and the city's assets. Uh, assignment of leases, so uh, any VC that is um, currently leasing from the city of Mr. or Husky would be transferred at time of title transfer and then warranties as any other standard, standard agreement. Uh, a couple things for council to consider uh, is to bring this agreement back to council at the next council meeting for, for direction or ask for further information or changes pertaining to the proposed land exchange agreement and have that brought forward to a future council meeting or request further information and have that come back to the future GPC. Um, I'll just grab it. So just to point out um, where these lands are uh, within city limits, well there's actually a parcel of the land is outside city limits, but the three parcels that the city is looking to exchange for the Husky parcel of land, um, the first one is directly south of the landfill, so this quarter, and I'll just zoom into that um, to give you a better idea. There's an existing right away there currently? Is it right? Yes, yes. Um, currently there's an extensive amount of bike lines that come down and cross the road. Uh, you can see where it kind of turns and goes to the south. So this has already got three or four different pipelines. That's actually what started this conversation with Husky. They were looking for more, more easement to do that. Um, the easement essentially sterilizes that portion of the lands and doesn't allow us to do any construction or development on top of that. Um, so that started the conversation with regards to the agreement that came in today. This agreement's been in discussion for probably well over three years. So this is something we've been working on for quite some time. Uh, the parcel, I'm just looking in the agreement and I want to point out the actual acres. Um, so this parcel, the city will be um, turning over 23 acres on the northern portion. So I want to point out that it's not the full quarter section being exchanged to Husky. It's only limited to 23 <coughs> acres. Um, the easement we were talking about is if the city requires an easement for our utility, deep utility mains that run north south, or a crossing to access the remaining land to the south, that Husky is willing to enter into those um, easements or rightways and that those would be negotiated on um, conditions related to those um, upon time of request. So that is parcel, I think they call that parcel B1, or we call it B1. Parcel B2 is, um, sorry if I zoomed out too quick, but we have Highway 17 here and 67th Street. So just north of the water treatment plant, uh, we have a parcel of land that was donated to the city back in 1994. Um, Husky has a current pipeline right away that runs through this parcel in this direction, east-west, and they are looking to purchase 2.6 acres or swap 2.6 acres of this land, which it essentially would move the north property line just south of that um, pipeline crossing that's currently in place, and that would form part of the agreement as well. 
just want to add some additional information. I know, um, I know this may be a question, but the city received this land um, as a donation back in 1994. Questions, comments, concerns. Uh, if I may, just 
If I could go back to the Saskatchewan side, the uh, dotted lines are rock and roll, right? Sorry, sorry to read this. The parcel just east of Highway 17 and further east of the Rock and Road is not. Did we not approve a sale of some of that already and widening for road widening and I don't think that we're ever going to build. I thought we were going to I think that's on the next quarter south of Coastal. Mm -hmm. I think that's on the next quarter. That's why we're going to that. So we're, Where are we already? We're adjacent to the south side of the left. Yeah? Is, uh, right? That's not the Rock and Road? No. no this rock is, and road. Yeah, sorry, Richard. This is Rock and Road. Uh, oh, road. okay. So there was an agreement to get that um, right away widened in order okay. to support some development to the west. This is the road that um, goes to the wastewater treatment plant as well as uh, Lucas Bond okay. uh, racetrack. Oh, that's good. Yeah. The other question I have is, <clears throat> and I'm sure it's stressed, uh, the chunk of land, the piece of land that's next to Highway 17, We've sold a bit of that already, I think, in some way. Um, I don't think we've it or sold it or something. Well, there was, there was some complications with where the property line was located, and I problems. think it would have to be adjusted based on the acreage to the north and where their um, field septic um, tank was located. So I think that was, that was dealt with uh, a few years ago. Uh, that was very minimal change. Um, again, we're looking to subdivide off to the top 2.6 acres, which over 50% of that is encompassed in the current right away. Um, it didn't, from a, from an administration perspective, any council can direct otherwise if you don't see see it the same way as administration. It didn't pay to have one acre parcel sitting to the north um, that has no access to it. <coughs> Clean it up the best we can to give benefit to both the city and to Husky within that regard. And it also provided some additional funds that we could use to pay for the evaluation of the Kodiak lines to the north. So, just uh, city manager reminded me just from a, an appraisal perspective, the city let, let the appraisal process we asked Husky to use the same appraisal company that we use with regards to our lands. Um, we both felt that was fair and equitable that, that we were using the same appraisal firms. So the same appraisal firm appraised all four properties and, and we adjusted um, the acreages to ensure we had a net zero balance uh, between the two parties. Just a fault, I was just wondering, at one time we had some legal obligations on that land. Is that being removed? No, I think the, the two leaders, I think the obligations that I heard from uh, executive understanding is there's to be, there was a talk of a park. I think the, the city was asked to build a park. Yeah. And, a, and, a, and, a, and again, the park, I don't think it was very specific. It just said a park and talked about a memorial and acknowledgement of the landowner that donated the land, which will be left to this kind of, to the council sometime, this council or another council once. Something happens on the remaining six. I, guess I think we really got to clear that with the family that donated that land. That's all I'm saying. Is I have no, no uh, objection. Just well, I think there's some obligations. No, we, we, have, we have a moral well, position. Absolutely, I think there's some obligations that are still outstanding. There's still land to, to do what they've asked yeah. from that perspective. Yeah, yeah I, I just wanted to add, like when that parcel develops, there is plenty of opportunity for the city to build a park and build a memorial and, and meet those obligations. Yeah. This, this agreement doesn't really impact that. Um, from a legal perspective, we, I guess we could, we could go to legal from my, my understanding of the agreements and the council resolutions and the documents that, that lead us here is the city has no, for, no obligation other than to commemorate the park, put up a sign, which I, I think we can do very easily if that was council's direction. Um, it doesn't restrict us from selling that land to anybody in the future. There's no encumbrances um, attached to that, and that's, that's stated pretty clearly in the letter that we've received. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
universal reason to me, it's a good faith thing. Yeah, absolutely. And then it comes with that, Chuck? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Rick. Yeah, and I think, the, and I may have misheard you on this, but I thought, you know, again, we got the property in 1994, and it was a 10-year window to meet the obligations, and after that, it was free and clear. So we've more than gone past that timeline, so maybe I misheard you, but... Uh, yeah, that's, that's, yeah. that's what the documents said. Yeah, that the so we're, we're 2019, we're, uh, and I never. think again, the moral responsibility of that, that other piece is there. Um, you know, you referenced the land testing on the northern Kodiak piece of land. Uh, do we know what's there at all, or, or can we assume what's there, or do we have any? I think permanent environment. Yes. Um, that is part of the agreement. So if we have some environmental documents, we will be providing the Husky as part of this. Okay. So there, um, there are some things that both parties are aware of. Um, okay. As far as I understand, uh, the North Kodiak site is free and clear of any, any environmental concerns. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Just you referenced it, and again, it's part of yeah, the site. So, so the agreement speaks to both parties having to disclose any environmental conditions that may be on lands. And again, like I said, there has been acknowledgement by both parties, and that we're dealing with that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, my question was just on the, the pipeline. So there's going to be a new or different pipeline path than there was before. And how does that impact at all the Northeast Area Structure Plan within that area? Because it's coming into the city within that Northeast Area Structure Plan area. I understand more or less what the land use was and, and maybe it is appropriate to have within there, but I just want to make sure that we're not starting to throw documents out like that. Yeah, the, the alignment isn't changing. There's currently pipelines in the alignments that they're, they're looking to basically bring under their own control. Um, like I said, they were looking for additional easement. Um, it's in Husky's interest to have that in the room so they have control of that. Um, so there's obviously some benefit to Husky in that parcel. As far as the the um, area structure plan, that it essentially becomes a right away versus an actual development parcel. So it doesn't have any implications on that area structure plan. Within the planning process, that's something that we will want if and when this gets approved, that's something we can definitely address through that process to make sure the proper zoning is attached to it. But it wouldn't change the overall of what the area structure plans and intent is. Okay. And just one other comment. This is part of my memory not being perfect. Did we already approve the Northeast Area Structure Plan, or has it not come back for final approval? Because I looked, I saw, I found a picture on the internet, uh, but it was a draft, and I don't know where the final is. The final draft is presented to come. Okay. okay. There's one other comment I guess I had is, is just as far as the agreement goes on that land. Uh, if we haven't already, would it at least be worth reaching out to the family and having a conversation with them and, and just making sure that, that everything's okay? Because as far as I'm concerned, what I'm hearing is we didn't exactly follow through on our responsibilities within that agreement. And uh, maybe from a legal perspective, based on the amount of time that's passed, we're free and clear, but uh, from a good thing to do, um, the city of Lloydminster as an entity, it's still their agreement, regardless of whether this council or this management that did it. Um, but, you know, in terms of best practice and being a good community steward, I think it would be worth reaching out to them and at least having a conversation with them prior to this coming back to council for final approval. I think you have a good point, councillor. I think that uh, any time any council, this council or the council's previous entered into some agreements and there's some recognition we should honor that as best as we can for the simple fact that uh, it leaves a bad taste in people's mouths when people don't follow through on their agreements. And I think we can do it relatively reasonable, I hope, uh, with working with administration on that piece. And again, at least recognize the formation of the land, first of all, the park. A park can be defined as a, simply an area that is uh, left to nature and people can enjoy. Park can be very defined, such as Bud Miller. So I think there's there's room for that, and I think the acknowledgement of the donation is the most important thing that we can go away with. I'd like to comment. I think that uh, <clears throat> we all know the news today, and we've heard it for months and months about pipelines. And Husky, in this opinion, is no different than 
with some of the issues facing us nationally. For Husky to continue to operate, I believe that they're looking to secure the ability to grow and do what they do. And if we, by doing this, we're working with an industry partner, a major employer of this community, a very permanent part of this community. I think that uh, I appreciate the land swap. They're looking for a zero value from that perspective. It makes it a little cleaner for their books, I'm sure. Uh, and from that perspective, I see it a double win because I think if we can help ensure Husky the ability to expand in this community as an employer, as a provider of jobs, working in the energy industry, that's huge. At the same time, the city's not giving them away the farm or getting additional property back to prepare for the future when hopefully those opportunities will arise. And I think that, uh, you know, I understand where they're at and if we can ensure that we're getting land that's not contaminated and all that due diligence is done, I think that I, I would certainly support this because I think it sends the right message to the industry. Uh, we're going to talk about that a little later, but I think it's, it's so important that if we can't do it here, Boy, I can't look to anywhere else and expect them to do it there. So I think there's a, there's a city that relies heavily on energy and the oil and gas industry. You know, I believe is a good deal, but I just got to make sure as it's been expressed around this table that we've covered off all the bases to ensure that the city's not left short. And I wouldn't expect us to be left short. It's a business arrangement. Uh, all of the numbers add up. It's a fair deal. But the city says we've got good land. I would certainly support that. Any other discussion or comments on anyone else to share? All right. Thank you very much for that executive manager standing. I think you've got some direction there from the committee. Thank you, Richard. Moving on to 4.3, I'll look to the city manager. Thank you, Richard, to present 4.3, fire master plan. I'll turn it over to the city clerk to present the number of city clerk. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, this is to provide the committee with the fire master plan for the review and comment. During the April 23rd, 2019 regular council meeting, council approved the administration to develop a comprehensive fire services master plan with the consultant. The fire master plan provides 34 recommendations to be implemented over time with considerations given to budgetary impacts of those recommendations. The fire master plan is recommending that council provide immediate consideration for the following items. The Council will accept the Fire Master Plan as a strategic planning document that will inform the development of the Lloyd Fire Service, Lloyd Mr. Fire Services in the coming years, in 10 years to be exact. A change in the fire services philosophy from primary, primarily the reactive response to provide these education, economic incentives, enforcement, engineering, and emergency response. And to group those a little smaller, we talk about um, the first um, with three smaller groups, subgroups, it will be public education, prevention, fire safety standards, and enforcement, and finally emergency response. And arguably, if we do the first two right, the uh, third one is lessened. These changes will occur over time as council adopts and implements strategic priorities outlined in the fire master plan through the creation of new fire bylaws, policies to ensure the optimization of public education, fire prevention, and the inspection programs. Second recommendation, recommendation is the council approve the addition of a fourth paid on call firefighter to the duty group. The addition of this paid on call will ensure that the fire services meet, meets requirements set up the National Fire Protection Association standards to conduct extrication at fire scenes. Further, that the remaining council and operational recommendation be reviewed, implemented, and ensure, ensuring the consideration given to the balanced budgetary responsibilities and ensuring the development of a strong and vibrant fire service with a focus on the five years. The fire master plan also encompasses a community risk assessment, which looks at the community's building stock, geographical, demographic, hazards, economic response, and fire profiles to identify prior and prior prioritize risks in the community. The Community Risk Assessment reviews this data and provides key findings to help inform the city's risk reduction strategies. For example, the fire, the, fire, the fire profile key findings identify that between 2007 and 2016, 22% of fires were caused by mechanical and electrical failure or malfunction. 44% of fires were caused by miscellaneous actual emissions, and 25% of fires were classified as arson or set fires. The information from these findings help formulate the responses in the fire master plan around education, engineering, and enforcement. When implemented, policy, code, 
or inspection solutions will aim to reduce the instances of fire and the need for the responses. The implementation of the fire master plan will, over time, reduce the incidence of fire, fire in the community by focusing priorities on education and prevention rather than reaction and response. The objective of this was to provide the draft fire master plan for consideration, which will help inform the future strategic operational direction of fire services in Westminster. And the options are the council recommend the fire master plan go forward to council for decision, or that the community request additional information for the fire master plan. There is government, governance implications in that the fire master plan includes recommendation for amendments to existing, as well as the development of new government documents, such as um, um, amendment to the fire bylaw or modernization of fire bylaw and policies. The financial budget implications is that the implementation of the fourth day on call position per shift will add four, four pay on call positions to the fire services and will have an approximate addition of $520,000 to the fire services annual budget and salary costs. The fire master plan and the community risk assessments overall budget was $109,870 and it is expected to be on budget. Thank you, City Clerk. Questions, comments? Councilor Dorsey. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just to confirm with administration, the 520,000, is that included in the calculation for the budget that was provided to council last week? That would be confirmed in anticipation of this happening and in, in from the direct past direction of council. We didn't include that. The lot wasn't 520, it was just under that $500,000 in the 2020 budget. Um, to compensate for that, if uh, if that is a true, if indeed council's wish at the next meeting when this comes for approval. My other question is just on um, as far as the fire master plan goes, everything I've read from it and everything I've seen makes a lot of sense as far as um, changing our focus from simply fire suppression to more of a fire prevention type model. And, and I have to say that everything I've heard sounds like it makes a lot of sense and we're heading in the right direction in terms of uh, reducing the probability of incidents and, and doing everything we can to you know, fight the fires before they happen type of thing. So I think that in the long run, it, it looks like a, a great plan. There's a, a lot of work that needs to be done over the next few years. And, and uh, from, from what we, you know, seen and read from it, it you know, all around, I think it's kind of hitting the nail on the head for where our city needs to go to move into a modern direction from a volunteer firefighter basis into you know, a modern firefighting system that you know really works in in this uh, in this decade and and with this size of community. Um, my other question, though, is just uh, ballpark because I, I don't expect you to have this. Exact number on the top of your head, but what on the operation side has our firefighting costs increased by from what it's going to be in this current year to what it was back in the volunteer days? I don't have that answer at my fingertips. Um, I don't know if the chief um, has that answer or if um, the CFO can help us. This is very, very ballpark, but volunteer model that we had. I believe our budget was around eight hundred thousand dollars in that size right range. And I believe now we're in the three plus million dollar range in terms of the cost. So and, and that's that's what I thought the answer was. Uh, in terms of how much the needle has moved in the last couple of years. Um, and this is why I think it's important. Uh, with the <coughs> operating budget that was presented by administration last week and the one we're going to be looking at uh, potentially you know, making decisions on in the next few weeks. Um, that number is quite large, like in the millions of dollars large that we have increased the operating cost on the fire side of things. Um, but then you look at what the mill rate increases are for the current year to really move into this model and get there. Um, I think administration does a fantastic job in terms of the level of service that's going to be expected of our fire department moving forward and the 
the way that we've really moved the needle on that and how much those costs have been minimized to the taxpayers, I, I think is a phenomenal job. When you consider how big of a step that that is and with the agreement that we got and, and everything else included in the fire services, it, it can't be said enough that to go from where we were um, from a fire service to where we're going to be at the cost to the taxpayer is is phenomenal. Like that, I just I almost can't believe that we did that or administration did that. I I more stood here and raised my arm every once in a while. Um, so great job on that. And you know, as far as I can see on the plan, it, it looks like a solid plan for a modern fire service. Yeah. Ballpark of forty-eight hundred thousand an hour about uh, in the budget today, not including the uh, the fourth person on the truck would be about three million dollars if he added that, so about three and a half million dollars. Thank you, Senior Manager, Councilor Lecher. Yeah, thanks, Richard. I, I really appreciated having the opportunity to sort of look through the plan. And it's fairly in depth, and there's you know a lot of technical information in there, but there are a couple things I think that I hadn't realized prior to this, and I know many people in the community don't that. You know, we currently run three men on the truck, or three firefighters on the truck, and then um, technically, from a safety perspective, we're not allowed to have them go into a building to extricate from the event because if someone's trapped inside the building. Um, when I've talked to people, I mean, the big question people often ask is, what do you get for, what do you currently get for the money you're paying? And what am I going to get now that, you know, there's going to be added cost? The reality is, is that we're able to fight fire, save lives in a way that we haven't been able to do before. And I think you know the, the, one of the challenges is that from, from a council perspective is are we getting value for dollar? And I think from a safety perspective, that's, that's the piece that we really need to make sure we keep in the forefront. That our ability now to fight fires to go in and save people if they're inside is, is now one more tool down the road as we have this four person we do that we're unable to do in the past. And I don't think many people, including me, realize that. I have to agree with the councillor. I had a chance to go through the fire report, uh, or the consultant's report, and some interesting information. If I read it right, we've never done a study like that's been done on the fire service in the city of Manchester. And that fire service has been here for an awful long time. Uh, from the days of smoke eaters and whatever they used for the original fire equipment to the, the technical information and equipment you have today, the knowledge, the training, we've made leaps and bounds changes. Uh, I go back to my days as a volunteer firefighter and we didn't have anything like talk about our HS and WCB to issues because the fire was on people right from the fire and did what they thought they needed to do. Hopefully we all came up alive. But today there are a little different uh, circumstances. The nuance has changed. The, the game has changed as it has in every business. I went to the construction industry and went to Councillor Baker. He, he could let me tell stories of how people used to hang on scaffolding with one arm and did their job and they did it very safely. But that's not acceptable anymore. But the fire service has moved on as well. That needle has moved dramatically. We saw a dramatic movement. <coughs> it's also had a cost. I think we've seen very clearly the cost. But I appreciate your comment, Councillor Manichak, because I think that's the important thing. What are people getting today based on the standards of today? And the cost of today. I think that's the realism that this council's faced uh, on this matter. And certainly the importance of the fire department can't say enough about it. I appreciate where the consultant is proposing to see that he's given us a roadmap, uh, a roadmap that it's up to this council and councils to follow. Because for people's information, there's 13 recommendations I've counted for the city administration and governance, mainly the city council, to set direction over the next 10 years. And, uh, the administration brought a couple of those forward with the discussion which will come to City Council in due time. But I think that's the important thing is that we have a responsibility to set some direction and there will be responsibilities from the operational side through the fire service and the department and as well as administration to bring forward. I think that this is a great start. It gives us a roadmap. Is it the perfect roadmap? I'm sure we'll talk about this. It may not be the perfect roadmap, but at least we have a roadmap to follow. Ten years worth. Hopefully, watch our city grow in those 10 years and have to adjust accordingly. I really want to say thank you to, again, everyone that helped 
give input. I know our administration was at the table at one time. I think council had that ability at one time. The firefighters themselves are full time and are paid on and are paid on call. Firefighters have the ability to have contributions as well as the fire chief and the administration that exists to fire service. So I think that, that says an awful lot that this report wasn't just put together by someone that walked in and said, "Oh, by the way, here's the snapshot." And I encourage anyone that wants to know more about the fire service to take an afternoon, an evening, and maybe a little longer to read 300 pages of very good information uh, from that perspective. I love the Councillor Buckingham because he lives this on a regular basis, but if you've never had any involvement with the fire service, this will help hopefully open your eyes to a piece of the city that we've taken for granted for an awful long time, and most people do. The fire department comes when you fall. Thank you very much. And that's it's a lot more than that. I appreciate moving the, the needle, talking about education, prevention, I think those are the key factors. Uh, I don't think the fire wants to go to the fire. They do it because it's, that's what they're called upon to do. But if we can prevent a fire, we can educate the youth of our community, uh, seniors, and do those things for fire prevention. It's no different than a forest fire. We don't want a forest fire. We always work to prevent it. But if it's there, they fight. So I want to really, again, compliment everyone that had an input to that plan because I think we've got a fairly good basis to build on and go from there. Any other comments, Councilor Baker? Your Worship, this is nothing directly to do with. Well, it's in the report, but it <clears throat> hasn't got anything to do directly with whether we increase our staffing or not. <clears throat> Excuse me. But on <clears throat> at the end, it said percentage of fires and how they were started. I don't know if it's twenty five percent of the fires were classified as arson or set fires over the last from. Uh, 2007 to 2016, over a 10-year period, 25% of the fires were caused by arson, according to this report. My curiosity is, how many are caught, or do you know that for a fact, and what happened to the arsonists? Like, do they go to jail, do they get, what happens to them, or do they just carry on life as usual? So what are the courts generally doing about that? And what success rate have we got in finding the arsonists? So I, I can't speak to historically what, uh, what happened anyway. But when we say set fires, we say, uh, for example, somebody burning weeds in their backyard or doing something like that. Those are things that, uh, that occur. Yes, there is uh, there is uh, fires that are set for nefarious purposes, but um, the report doesn't delve down into that um, the information. Mm -hmm. That's how they were classified when they were reported. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Yeah. Tell us about that. Thank you, Worship. Yeah, fairly close to my heart. Um, you can say that people have said that they've seen a very big change in our fire service in the last year. People see the truck out more and more. And what I can tell you is that this report is, is very in depth. And it gives that 10 year roadmap, and you're going to see more of it. And there are good reasons for it. There are things we talk about often around this table the things the city are responsible for, and the things the city should not be responsible for. Well, this is an essential service. Then the city is responsible for it. And this group is moving that needle forward. Yes, it comes with a cost, but at the end of the day, public safety is, whether it's RCMP or fire, it, it does fall to this table. And this is a great roadmap. There's a ton of recommendations in there that will set us a good, good path going forward for the next 10 years. And um, the guys are out there and girls are out there doing a great job of it now. And you're going to see nothing but an increased presence in the community from our fire service going forward. And that's a wonderful thing to see. Thank you. Any other comments? Questions? Thank you very much, the clerk. Moving on to agenda 4.4. Thank you, Worship, to present the uh, 4.4 draft 2020 meeting schedule last night on the board. Good afternoon, Your Worship and Council. Good afternoon. I'm here to present the 2020 draft meeting schedule. In alignment with the past, this continues with meetings on Monday at 1.30 p.m. with the odd one changing to Tuesday if there's a staff. The procedure bylaw, bylaw 14 2017, does require that the meeting schedule be set before December 31st of every year. Once the meeting is set, then any changes to the schedule can be incorporated at any future meeting by resolution. 
So we just brought forward today to look for your feedback on any changes that may be required. Thank you, Mary. Questions, comments? Councilor Dorsey. Never mind. <laughs> 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 no problem. I think it's not. Oh, it's very so, uh, for anyone that's looking at this from the, uh, certainly from the public side, we have three identified the conferences. And it's a good opportunity to talk about our my intervention nature as usual. It adds to the dimensions. Uh, in February, we have the Saskatchewan Urban Municipalities Convention. Uh, we have the yellow to, in June for the Canadian and for the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. And in September, uh, that will be the Alberta Urban Municipalities Association. So it's certainly from that perspective, I think it's important that uh, people are aware that uh, talking about this, we are now entering our fourth year as council. So there will be an election held on November 9th, 2020, for a new council in the fall uh, as we go into the new year. And uh, time that's been allocated for the swearing in as well as council orientation, which was only three years ago for, for my councillors and that around the state. Seems uh, like yesterday in some ways. But certainly we made the allowance uh, as best as we can for uh, following the two council meetings of GPC, uh, except for July and August. Councilor Dorsey. Thank you, Worship. Um, I'm just curious if it's um, worth our while to put kind of the deadline type date of when the budget is you know, ideally approved the same way we do with our real rate bylaw, just as something so that we're looking at it, you know, a year ahead, and then that, that always gives you kind of a timeline. And, and I wonder if it's important for, you know, those first drafts. Is it important for it to go through in October or not with an election coming? I don't know. Because I, I know that some, some thought of that as being a political document when it came out prior to the last uh, municipal I, I didn't see it that way, but yeah, that's a discussion that we need to have with council here for the 2021 budget. I guess we need to see what the wish list is. An October timeline would be very well, it's tight, would be tight and would be very aggressive, uh, but it's something that if council gives us that direction, we have to move forward with. So, um, past that, anything past the November 9th election is very challenging if the council was to have the full, a new council was to have the full input that is required to make a decision on the budget too so um so those those are discussions yet that we would like to have with this council to see what direction we'd like to have i just think that in one way or another um it's going to be a really awkward based on when the election moved to because for those who don't know uh, the ministry of government relations in saskatchewan chose to push our election date two weeks out, which just makes it very awkward for budget purposes next year. So, you know, do you have a full day session to go through the line by line items with your new council within the orientation? Is that realistic to be able to do that and then go through the process of approving a budget, you know, within a reasonable amount of time? Or is it something that is expected uh, passing the budget and then maybe reaffirmed by a new council? I don't know. It, it's just kind of an awkward timeline of when that might actually happen. So I think it's almost worth administration sitting down and setting somewhat of a goal. Regardless, this is you know changeable, and those dates of all things are not set in stone. It's more of a suggestion, but uh, I think that it's a bit of a pickle that's going to need to be solved as to whether um, you want significant input from existing council or new council, and how that's exactly going to work. Uh, with when that date is. I'll leave it at that. Councilor Fletcher. I think it's a really good point. I, I think the, the important part that I would just like to highlight is that the, the next council walking in uh, will have a far better opportunity to be able to see all the numbers and data than, than our first review that we had several years ago. Uh, and so I, I guess I, I think that's important. So coming in new, I think, and, and seeing the organization that will be presented to the new council, I'm, I'm a lot more confident about the capacity to be able to address the issues. Um, I mean, there's a lot of stories that we often share about where we were uh, three years ago and then we're not there anymore. We're in a much, much better place relative to where we're going. So uh, I, I would think if we even had a first draft by the 
before the election, at least setting up the next council to have something to be able to review as opposed to build it right from scratch. You can always amend in your second and third meeting, but uh, you at least have a starting point. Uh, I think it would be unfair to do anything more as well as anything yeah. less, and, and because ultimately that council should approve the budget for the following year. Yeah. Councilor Baker. Your Worship, I've seen this thing from two sides. Um, what you're saying all sounds good, but there's another side to it. It's called looking at the budget. If this council approves the budget for the following year, new council has no input. We approve the budget. If we have a 80 or 90 percent ready to go and work with the administration for three months or two months or whatever we do, and then the new council can come in and see all the things, and the city manager and, and finance department can explain it to the new council, and they can go through it, and they can make any adjustments or things. They may have some wishes that you and I don't have, and they can make that final adjustment. They're not going to change the world. But to sign off before, normally the elections are in the middle of October or something. Later on. It's a little later this year because of the province. But just think about that. But if you're a new council, say, well, you just be looking at the budget. They've already approved it. So this way they have to look at the budget. Yep. And I've seen it from both sides. So I appreciate you guys. Yeah. Sorry, I think that the, the intent I heard from this, uh, to this point is that this council would not, would not approve the budget. We would simply start the process and get that first draft potentially if it works with the administration to get it out front so that people know some idea and, uh, and you're absolutely right i would never expect that we would pass a budget as this council going into 2021 uh, after the election is held and the new council would make that final decision because as we've talked about the budget is, is a budget it can be amended at any time and from that perspective so i think that the question is can we get it started so at least it's out there because as we've all experienced, this, most of this comes out of yourself when we walked in, that was our first budget. And uh, I think that having some groundwork done would be, a, would be an asset to the next next people who are Thank you, Worship. I just want to uh, correct what I had said a second because it made it sound like this current council would approve the budget. I, I was just throwing out random things and that came up wrong. I don't think that, that would be appropriate by any means for the council that is ending their term to approve an entire year after they would be done by their term. So, yeah. Your words were made. Look, the fact that the election is later is why I said 80 or 90 percent. We can have it ready to go with the city manager and, and the finance department and the, the management team say here's, here's what's being proposed yeah. by the last council. Now we want you to go through it and discuss it and see if you're okay, if you want to make any changes. But their timelines are getting really tight because they'll be into, I don't know when it is. Uh, until later it's November probably, before we have our first meeting. It'll be the first of December before they even go to City Hall, it's probably, unless they have here before. Uh, so that was why I was encouraging to try and get most of it done, but don't approve it. Let that council approve it and have given a chance to review and then it's their budget. They own it. Absolutely, Councilor. I think one will take it. Is there any dates that anyone sees right off the bat? And I know this is a draft and this is why I'm really appreciate her bringing it forward. Is there any uh, challenges right now? Councilor On the August 10th one, are we going to have cake for other things? <laughs> well, we could maybe have something afterwards. Any other issues that are burning right now? <laughs> well, thank you very much, Mary, for bringing this forward. And uh, this will come back, I believe, in December meeting for the final. Uh, yes, December 16th. Great. Thank you very much. Moving on to the agenda now that we've got the cake out of the way. Take the whole week of my birthday off. So. <laughs> okay. We'll get to that later. Moving on to governance, priorities matters. Uh, 5.1. Let's let the city manager. 
Thank you, Roger. Uh, to present 5.1 administrative amendment to land use bylaw 5, 2016. I'll ask Natasha to find you to come forward. Thank you, Roger.
So we were constantly kind of trying to come down to a general interpretation. Some are constantly occurring issues of either permits that are being approved or conditions that are constantly being put on. How can we make that easier for the developer and city administration right up front? Perfect. Natasha, it's got parking requirements and I've just made a note that a question mark. Is handicapped parking the part of that parking requirements that's being looked at? Um, in some, but I can definitely flag it to make sure it's been evaluated. Yeah, please do because I think I three years sitting here, our handicap parking continues to reoccur and just to get some clarity around that. Uh, everybody's on the same page from going forward and where we are today. And, uh, to relieve some of the, some citizens in our community's issues that they experience. And certainly one of the challenges that I do hear one more often than not. Okay. Anyone else have any thoughts or suggestions? Anywhere? Thank you, Natasha. And I see, I believe you're uh, back up here on 5.2. Yeah, I <laughs> so we're here just to um, inform council about the City of Westminster Municipal Planning Process. Over the last year, planning and development has worked to um, identify clear and concise um, expectations and deliverables associated to the development process. Planning and development has determined that we have a need to close gaps and consolidate information in a user-friendly document that's readable and understandable for residents, contractors, um, and developers. This document is also to, um, to mark the city that we are developer-friendly and we are open to new development. Currently, the City of Boyminster, in our development process, you can find information in the Municipal Development Plan, the Guide to Plan Development Process, the Area Structure Plan Policy, the Area Structure Plan Preparation Guidebook, in various fact sheets. All these documents listed outline the general expectation of the process. However, the overall intent of the municipal planning process is to be an all-encompassing guidebook from raw land to occupancy permit. Planning and development with the support of other internal departments has reviewed the document to ensure compliance is maintained with the Municipal Government Act as well as our higher level planning documents. Earlier this year, planning and development um, engaged in an area structure plan with Lakeside. Um, we aligned with our policy, but we also implemented key components of what we are bringing forward in the municipal planning process. It was determined that early engagement, strong lines of communication, and clear deliverables were items in the success and review of the Lakeside Area Structure Plan. Mm -hmm. um, our intent is to engage with developers early in the process to learn their intent for development and opening the lines of communications to build relationships and actively engaging with them. Following direction from the committee, planning and development will complete the consultation with stakeholders and bring forward the municipal planning process as a policy document to council for approval. Additionally, this will also trigger some amendments to the MDT to ensure consistency through all of our documents. Thank you, Natasha. I think uh, the words I heard. Thank you, Worship. Does this mean that when I ask the question, basically every time you present, does it go in this order, where I say, you know, land use and then subdivision, all that other stuff, there will just be a document that shows me every step of the way, so that I don't have to ask you the same question in terms of the order that things go? Um, I think it's highest sense, yes. Okay. okay. Will it be, like, how, how big of a document are we talking about? Is this just a brochure level thing, or is this a book? No, um, right now, my last draft was just over 30 pages. Okay. Um, it's, it's longer. Um, it's kind of broken down into different steps, so you can jump around throughout the document depending on exactly what you're looking for. But like I said, our intent was to bring it in one place, because right now people come and they start one application, and then it has to jump to a different process and we're having some breaks in communication between administration and um, the general public, I guess. Okay, um, and other than that, so on a land division and land development side of things, would this be something that we would be taking to see site selectors and things like that on the uh, economic development front as well, to say, oh, okay, here's, here's, here's the process, here's who you have to call. Uh, yes, our intention is that this development does um, continue to market the city as developer friendly and also shows that we are willing to actively engage in developers 
that yes, there is a business business component to the relationship, but like I said, in the Lakeside Area Structure Plan, we um, engaged with the developer significantly, um, built the relationship, opened the lines of communication, and that led to a very successful development project. Right on. Thank you. I want to just uh, go off of Council Torson's uh, comments that I think this indicates a customer service business that you folks are in because it's planning and development. You are working with economic development, sometimes the first keys to our community, to a developer, to a, a site selector. And I think that having uh, being able to provide them with clear and concise information is what they're looking for. That's what I've heard in conversations with uh, uh, in the economic development side. I think it helps push economic development as well because. As a city, we do have land. We have land to develop. We have uh, great services. We've got two railways. And I think it's important that putting all those pieces together because uh, development and uh, planning and development play a key role. In it. We often hear of how fast we go. I'd love to see us reach that point as a community uh, working through the processes because if it's clear the communication's there, you're going to get things moving faster rather than the hurdles. And if we can eliminate the hurdles, I think we've got a long, long ways to make our community more business friendly from the perspective of uh, if you want to make a decision then it's going to go to the board of directors table if they want to be able to move on it if they're ready and if they're hung up for 60 days or 90 days you know, so we can shrink that process and make sure that uh, where they say boy we've got great communication going on these people want to work with us that indicates an awful lot so thank you so much for that i think that sends a very clear message to our business community and the business community at large that uh, we are open for business and that's what we want to do for the Play big roles. Thank you very much for that. Any other comments? We look forward to seeing you come back with action. Thank you so much. Moving on to 5.3, City Manager. Thank you to present the 5.3 2020 draft budget and order. So I'll pass to the CFO and give us some talk.
is a summary of our outstanding debenture balances. The blue one that's difficult to see, the white blue one, it includes the existing and projected debt, and the gray line is our 75% debt. So yeah. I'm going to stop you for a second, Chief Financial Officer. The projected debt was the more on for a fire pump and the wastewater treatment plant. Yes, okay. not including cultural center. Okay. So then we, we added this graph. So this graph shows our debt payments. So the navy blue includes the existing uh, principal and interest. I think if you look close, you can see the line that shows the difference between the principal and the interest, but the blue is our current debt and the yellow is our additional debt. Proponent to phase it over a number of years to keep under that 75% limit. That's Yeah, so I think the, the important thing for you know, council and residents to know is that uh, the amount of money service the debt based on the projections that we have. Um, that's going from around $3 million to $5 million. So that's $2 million straight up on debt that will be increased to the overall city budget that will be required to come from either utility revenue or from property taxes, depending on which item the debt relates to. Which is, you know, when you, when you think about that, if right now $300,000 is uh, Half a percent? Is that what it is? 360 is 1%. 360 is 1%. In the tax rate. In the tax rate. So, mind you, that's going to change a little bit between now and then, but you're still talking about. Uh, I'm not good at math, somebody else should be doing this. Um, I don't know, 5-6% just on, in increases just on debt service. something to, to be aware and that's why I realized that we're on our way there in terms of multi-year budgets and things like that and we've, we've made a lot of strides with where we're at now but we're going to eventually move that yardstick and get to multi-year budgets but these will be you know useful projections for understanding uh, what has to happen in the mill rate or in utility rates over a longer you know time horizon uh, in terms of the planning for those things but thank you for the information I appreciate it I think it's very useful uh, to know and understand and that's just the impact on the capital side. That doesn't talk about any increased operational costs right. to the water treatment, wastewater treatment plant, or new fire hall, or culture and science, or whatever project that is. That's just the capital component that that, just did, that, that increase takes care of. Please carry on. Functionability 
and is not currently upgraded. The transition to Esri will first mean a transition from the current GIS database in Oracle to an Esri one saved on a SQL server. Um, in essence, our, our base program for our GIS software is reaching in the life and we need to upgrade and move forward to better support our departments. Thank you, Executive Manager. Councilor. So this this may oh, thank you. This this may be a bigger picture question, but for the amount like because I just I still am green on this GIS stuff a little bit as far as I know it's it's pictured like aerial pictures from above and that tells you stuff. But uh, how how often is this an everyday use like? I believe it's someone's full-time job, but it's an everyday use of this program that pictures are being taken from above. I just wonder if these are the kind of things where, you know, if there's someone else who just takes a picture every once in a while when you need it, and you pay them, I don't know, a thousand dollars for a picture, or I don't know, hundred dollars for a picture. I don't know what the cost is, and whether or not the hundred thousand dollars this year and hundred thousand dollars the year following and hundred thousand dollars the year following. If that is good value to have this in house versus um, contracting that picture from somewhere. Yeah, I understand. So I might have to bring our director of engineering uh, up here, appointing the chair. But from my perspective, it's not just a picture from above. That, that's a layer that's in the background of the entire database system. Um, it's with regards to all our piping. Our condition um, assessments of all our pipes, the age, the depths of all our pipes, all that information is extremely important to. Sorry. No, so I, and that's where maybe I'm disconnected from this because I didn't understand this as having a connection to like capital asset management. It doesn't. Yeah, I'll answer this one. You're referring to our formal initial question part of this, and that has a different ask in, in, in our budget side of things, because uh, therefore is, not, is used more for the GIS side of things, but also for the tax assessment side of things. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a few uses of that. The GIS system itself is a, is a really analysis tool. So we can take a lot of information from a lot of different aspects of the, of, of the whole corporation, dealing with assets, as, as, a, as, a, as a manager Don brought forward, but also our financial side of things and, and everything else, and bringing them all together and, and providing a, a basically a report, a visual report of the condition of a pipe, a water pipe. So we can actually for all cast iron or greater than 50 years old that have a rating of this and blah, 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 blah and we can come up and map that. That's that analysis capabilities of uh, GIS. So this is a different tool than what I understood it to be. Yes. yes. So I will leave it at that. I don't think you were off, Councillor, just because there was a request for a priori air flow update for a very similar. That was, this should be only 30,000 for that perspective. Yeah, there's a, uh, well, we just did that air flow this year for $100,000. Um, so I was thinking we're going to kind of tie it up with there. Going forward, yeah. it's just that, it's that system. It's, so, Going on here, Councillor, the, the projection looking at the future budget from the back to the original request. This is an ongoing, this could be an ongoing process. Like where the hundred thousand dollar ask is not going to be, it could be repeated once or twice more easily going forward. Is that I see this um, sort of kind of sign curve a little bit, it'll kind of rise up and it'll lower itself down to a probably manageable level over the years, and maybe even zero too. It really depends on the capabilities that the departments or the users need. And if they're met, then we don't need to an ask that year. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's, I, mean, I always get concerned about technology from the perspective of the software because they do upgrade. So what you're proposing, this is one that we expect is going to have some shelf life, five, 10 years, but in my world, but, uh, from what we can all indication, because what we're using today is come to end of life. You know, we know that we can't keep up with IT because IT is fast as we can buy all the computers it's updated, which I appreciate, but there's always something better than what, is there some assurances from the software perspective before we make that punch and we've got something that's going to last us long? Yeah, uh, Esri uh, is, is pretty well industry known okay. and very uh, top of line, not I should say top of line, but it's very well known and established throughout, uh, 
Brook Canada and the United States. A lot of municipalities do use as many tools for GIS systems. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions on this one? Thanks very much, Terry. Thanks, Terry. See you full. The next question we have is on and on fire services for the AFAC radio integration portals. And the, uh, the question was the number of portable media by the fire services. Uh, and, uh, the answer is 22, um, but it did include some spares. The chief has uh, responded that uh, if we did not purchase the spares, we may be able to lower the ask by maybe $700. Once again, uh, the spares provide us an uh, operational um, uh, okay. Thank you. Any other questions on this one? Yeah, I'm still concerned on this one, just, just a little bit. Um, that AFRAC system is similar to the one that Saskatchewan uses, the, the TSM type of system, right? The interdepartmental communications piece is questionable. Um, with that PTSM system that I use where I am, uh, I can't talk to anybody else. That's it. So it's kind of it's tough that way. I just can't get my head around 22 guys carrying these or 20 or 18 or whatever it is. We run with one. You know, and we still have that communication. And I understand the integration piece in, in the 911 dispatch center, absolutely. But I just wonder if we have to go that far. That's great. New York, when I got thinking about it after the last meeting, this is to contact people. Um, there's other devices out there. Everybody's got a cell phone today, and maybe we could set up uh, something on the. And this is I'm the last guy to bring this up. You know that. But we can contact them on the cell phones. Because today I was thinking of this when we talked about 50 people on call. So which 20 get the radios? I mean, that don't even answer. I was thinking, do you mean to tell me we're going to have to increase the radios to 50? But I was wondering if there's something through the cell phone system, a program that you could alert mobile firm and rather than buy all these radios and maintain. Just a question. Well, good question, Councillor. I think it's a good question to answer. So, so we're clear it's a, it's a radio system that the first responders would use. Could you speak into the mic, please? Sorry. So we're clear it's a radio system that first responders would use. And, and I can set up a scenario for you where you could have a uh, an accident scene that's uh, over maybe a half a block in our community, RCMP constable down the road. Currently what happens is if the fire services needs to speak to the RCMP and that's what's happening today, is a radio or a dispatch. Our dispatch um, takes a message um, and at that point tries to pass it to that constable. Um, what these radios will do will give them the ability to speak directly to each other. The cell phones um, don't really work in that situation as, as you've suggested. So again, to answer it further, if I can't answer, these won't be uh, carried by uh, paid on call firefighters all the time. 50 came to my head. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I'm not here. So the, the dispatch system is one system. This is the communication system. What's an emergency, a fire, whatever they've been dispatched to, I believe would be a toy for. So well, I see the police using their cell phones all the time. Absolutely. That's why I ask. Yeah, there's, and, and there's some reasons behind that as well for some of the, the, the conversations they have to have at any kind of scanners. But for this case, it's not every fire fighter will be packing the radio. The intent I understand is that we we'll land on that. But My understanding is not every firefighter will have a radio. That's not the intent. Uh, my understanding is not every firefighter will have a radio. That's not the intent. Um, we can certainly go back and speak with the chief and look at what, what, um, what the operations is. This is being phased in, I believe, over a two year period. Um, we can once again um, speak with the chief and find out what the opportunities are there and respond to council. Um, but once again, this is this is a safety item for the fire, firefighters. I guess there's all kinds of ways to figure out why we can't do it. But I'm just saying that the people are doing it every day yeah. in business and everywhere. And I just wondered if there was a better system than buying these ratings. That's all. Thank you. Okay, Councilor Bunyan. I think to, to clear it up a little more, to defend the purchase, as opposed to by asking the question in the first place, just to clear it up, this would be command. This is a radio that, that the 
commanding officer of that scene would be using to communicate with the RCMP, with the dispatch center, with all those things. Wouldn't be going to every other, every firefighter. It's direct communication to the dispatch center and the, the other agencies within the city that are there. So in our scenario, understand that. In our scenario we, wouldn't even, we wouldn't even give this radio to anybody else because there should only be, we follow the ICS system, there should only be one person in that communication anyway. Yeah, I, I think there's some clarity we may need from the chief just to understand it, because I'm kind of curious, is this the communication between firefighter and firefighter as well? That's that's the question for whoever has a radio, so that may need a little more clarity if we can submit And if you recall, the, uh, the chief and on the mentioned that one of the, one of the um, things about this radio is the penetration of um, the lady within the fire scene, so if our firefighters are, for example, in the mall with the current radio because of the structure of the building, um, even though the mall's across the street, they have difficulty communicating with uh, with dispatch, with this uh, AFRAX radio system that's eliminated and they get better penetration with the radio systems as well. Okay. Any answers? Still, uh, still looking for a little more direction or questions on that? I think from what we're talking about, it was like a little more, I think everybody's kind of on there. I think we'd like a little more clarity on that particular $100,000 Except you. Not, not, not that one. That one to me is a little more straightforward. I guess I just like some clarity on the exact numbers. How many spares are we buying? And how much we actually will be deployed when they, if we make the purchase. So that, no, I do appreciate the duty to have spares. And I guess that's, and he, I did, he indicated $8,700 saving with spares. How many actually deploy? Because I think that's the question. If, if there's one for every four firefighters or two firefighters, that, that's all just it so that we're clear that. They're, they're being well used. Okay. So, so we're going to be two spares that they're purchasing and they're doing with 20 more numbers and I can get um, how they would be deployed. So that's what yeah, sure. that would, I think that would answer your question. Okay. Any other comments? Going back to the CFO for the next one. The next question was on the airport uh, taxi way Yeah, thank you. Uh, so the question was regarding the master plan for the Pathy Airport. So just some additional information that I got since the last time. The, the project is proposed to be supported by a grant application through the SKFGT grant. Um, please don't ask me what that was. Thank you. There it is. That's why he's sitting there during the week. <laughs> uh, similar to the project for, or similar project for 2019. Uh, part of this is a two-year program where our tax will be required significant upgrades. With regards to the master plan, we don't believe there is an impact to the quality of the location as the upgrade of these services. The taxiway upgrade is the area coming from the lease hangers uh, to the air, air, airstrip. Uh, City of Lloyd owns the property in front of them, and a lot of the taxiway services were not done properly and being dealt with through previous capital plans. This has, uh, this has been a multi-year project, so over the last three years, uh, project to upgrade the existing services. Administration hopes to continue the work until the existing services are upgraded um, to the standards they should be. Um, the past confirmed we did receive the grant for this year and we're matching that as we move forward. That's what of course. Two things. Um, so was that shown as being funded by grant revenue on the on the document we saw last week? Because I didn't think that it was. I, I don't think we gave you the details, but we have proposed that one to come from the Saskatchewan Federal Gas Tax again because we knew it was supported last year, so we know it will be supported again. Okay. And then I, I don't know if I misheard you or if you said it quickly. So as far as how is this affected by the airport master plan, there was no, no issue. So I think that's, that's where my line of questioning was last week is whether or not we were jumping the gun on it. Yeah, from our perspective, administration perspective, my perspective, there would be no bearing on this work with regards to the master plan. It wouldn't be something, the master plan would help tell us to do something different. This is our way of getting planes to the airway from the existing leases and uh, anchors that are currently in place. Perfect, thank you. Any other comments? No, <laughs> back to the 
foreseeable. The next question we have was on fleet services, uh, road to single axle truck. We were unable to change the description on that this time, but we will know for uh, when it was brought to council meeting. Yeah, we talked about this last last council. This is a single axle that we are replacing with a tandem axle truck. It's the third of the three that were requested last year. We did two last year, probably we did the last one this year. Okay. The next question was under engineering the 50th Avenue Highway 17 timing and coordination improvement construction. And the question was regarding um, crosswalk, crosswalk lights at 44th Street at um, 47th Avenue and 57th Avenue. Yeah, so the improvements at the intersections are 44th Street at 47th Avenue and 44th Street 57th Avenue are associated with infrastructure upgrades, which are recommendations within the traffic signal upgrade project. The work will upgrade aging infrastructure such as poles, lights, activation buttons, etc. As much of this infrastructure at these intersections has reached the end life cycle. The improvements along 44th Street, which are being completed in 2019, uh, are associated with the Centrix ATM system and only consist of hardware upgrades necessary to have the intersections interface with the Centrix ATM system as opposed to the link and uh, infrastructure improvements. It should be noted that the Centrix ATM system implementation along 44th Street will not adjust hardware uh, software at the intersection of 44th Street, 47th Avenue, and 57th Avenue as these are pedestrian path signals that are not to be tied into the system. Work is being completed at the intersections, therefore this is not a budget item, or not a budget item. Uh, the work along 50th Avenue will not touch these intersections as this program is strictly along, sorry, that's with regards to project 21 or 2013601. Uh, doesn't touch these intersections as it's strictly for 50th Avenue. So, with regards to the timing project that's currently in the works today uh, along Highway 16, my understanding is these intersections were not included in that timing program as they are purely activated on push button. Uh, with the improvements, um, they will continue to be um, pedestrian activated, but my understanding is the center system will take those into consideration and adapt as the traffic flows through. So if the system's not acknowledging traffic volume at 56 Avenue, for example, it will continue to be green until it showed traffic has come through, so it adapts to the pedestrian crossing lights where it currently has, doesn't have that ability. So it was excluded from, from that project because there isn't centric hardware, but when we do upgrade the infrastructure and the equipment, we would, we would make sure that it is integrated into the central system. I know that's a lot. Yeah, it is. And I, and I think Council Torsen, as uh, you're sitting here, I think we're on the same wavelength. If I was on the understanding, the understanding was we were, when we brought that or the administration brought that forward through engineering that that was going to happen with those two crosswalks. But I, I stand to be corrected. So if it doesn't tie that into the crop, this is what needs to tie into the crosswalks. I guess we it's it's required because there's no question that to go and get all the lights synchronized on the 17, the 16 highway going through the city and then having those crosswalks continuously provide that interruption. I think that we missed we missed the boat. So. Yeah, I see Terry sitting back there. Maybe maybe he can help me out here a little bit. But my understanding is the work that's being done will improve our traffic flow through the city. Uh, whether it's in the current state at those two intersections or not, the my understanding of the complete project is the poles, the infrastructure needs to be upgraded, and therefore when we do upgrade it, we would also upgrade the hardware to adapt. Now, my understanding is the system is smart enough that it can adapt with the current hardware. It's that the infrastructure requirement is outweighing the hardware upgrade if that, if 
I don't know if that adds clarity or adds more confusion. So well, it, it, it adds some clarity. So you're saying that we didn't try to improve this project and it get better, but you're also saying what I'm understanding is that we need, there's some hardware and the actual physical infrastructure that needs to be replaced as well at this time that is not part of the current lighting program. Yeah, so the current program that's going on right now is strictly hardware. Yep. Uh, those intersections to make sure that that flow is going through here. This is more than hardware. This is replacing poles. This is replacing activation lights, buttons, and hardware will also be included as part of that upgrade. Can you, yeah, can you, can you clarify, Terry? When yeah. our current system, we try to get um, out. Yeah, the, the two crosswalks for sure, especially the one on 47th Avenue is, well, that one's quite old. And then, of course, the infrastructure there needs to be upgraded uh, accordingly on the poles. I'll even the controller just like that, too. So when we look at that, that's where we look at the, um, the adaptability or the integration side of this. The initial um, uh, single timing program that we have initially was just our traffic intersection stuff, not the crosswalk side of this. Um, so with our single hardware improvement program, that's where we are targeting our um, crosswalks. Uh, the three main crosswalks, 47th Avenue, 44th, 56th Avenue, 44th, and then Highway 17 and 55th Street, or something like that, 56th Street. Um, again, those, even at 56th Street, that one's been in, in place for a long time and is definitely in need of some uh, some upgrades. So we're dealing with the whole of threats, and as such, that's why the cost is well yeah. indicative of that. And I can relate from the perspective of Saskatoon that they've had poles actually fall over because of deterioration and the issues around that. So I'd rather not have a pole fall over if it's, there's questions about structure or something like that. But hard to imagine pole wears out, but it does wear out. Yeah. As for how, how those crosswalks and how they're going to work with sand tracks and stuff like that, again, we haven't fully implemented the system, so we're not, we don't know the, the nuances yet. But again, it is supposed to, it, it's, it's supposed to adapt itself and a lot of stuff like that too. Um, so that's what we're looking for and we're engaging that. And of course, we can make further support of it too once we have that. We got James on there, so. Yep, you guys are. <laughs> and I, I talked to James, too. that question that came up, how is that integrated? My understanding, so we're integrating the traffic lights. Um, so if, if there's a pedestrian that hits that button, it stops traffic. The system is smart enough downstream to understand something is disrupting traffic, something is holding traffic back. It will adjust its system and timing that when it starts to see traffic flow, it will adjust that to move that traffic through, through accordingly. Yeah. So it's not necessarily currently tied to the system, yet the system is smart enough to integrate to ensure traffic flow continues. Okay. So the big question that matters to me anyway, is does it work better with the new ones or leaving the existing ones and still make the adjustments on its own? Like I just well, Plan can be found uh, 
within the master plan on pages 95 and 697. The recommendations provided within the 2015 master plan are limited in scope and do not provide recommendations or guidance with respect to pedestrian crossing safety and system-wide initiatives. Rather, the recommendations are based on improving connect connectivity only. The trail and sidewalk master plan will be dedicated to master plan associated with pedestrian connectivity, crossing safety, safety measure implementation, warrant criteria, um, for example, the RRFDs, which are the flashing pedestrian crossing lights. The intent with this master plan would be to review the traffic patterns of pedestrians and provide recommendations and future forecasting for the movement of this mode of transportation. The engineering services team deem this as a separate program away from the transportation master plan as a review, analysis, and recommendations needed to be specifically tailored to pedestrians and connectivity in both the existing and proposed neighborhoods. The transportation master plan focuses on the movement and growth of motorists and vehicles which would have basic, which would have drastically different review criteria than the trails and sidewalks. Councilor Torsten. Councilor Torsten. Councilor Torsten. I accept that the scope is larger in this proposed plan from what is in the existing plan. However, in terms of what needs to be replaced in terms of connectivity and what needs to be upgraded, I feel like it's already there with pricing and gives you kind of a picture of what you need to do in uh, or what is it, short term, medium, and long term. So the question is, is it worth your money? Because the main thing that you're getting that's different in this one, to me, and, and there's some things as far as you, know, you have bicycles on the road and things like that, and, you know, different options that could exist. But the main thing I'm hearing you telling me is, is crossings. Well, how much do those crossings with the solar lights cost? We were looking at some for uh, the helipad, and they're what, 20? 20,000 for those? Yeah, that's so, a special circumstance. And those might even be on the high side then. Yeah. How many crossings could you pay for for the $150,000 you're gonna spend on a plan to decide where you're going to put those crossings? If you follow logic of where people- I'm following your logic, so what criteria would you base on where those Safety pedestrian crossing should go. Like, I, I get what you're saying, but at the end of the day, from an administration perspective, we feel it's important to look at the pedestrian movement uh, with regards to safety and crossings, um, all those criteria uh, outside of the transportation master plan. Uh, again, it's under council's purview. If you would like us to defer, that's something we can definitely go back and look at to find out what the implications are of the different program. I guess just thinking about it, you could start throwing out six crossing things to improve visibility in sight per year for the next three years. And that would be, you know, 18 crossings right there and you didn't have to spend $150,000 to get there. And are you, if you're wrong, and there's one that's more popular, you find out <coughs> I just don't, I don't know that the plan does that much for you. So to me, this is one that if I was to pick something from the budget to cut because I think it already exists within another document and that, uh, you know, sometimes planning, planning to an excess doesn't necessarily give you a better product or answer. And, and I, don't, I don't know that what you described is that's that much of an improvement over, you know, what we have right now. That's just my opinion. One counsel. Councilor Baker. Thank you, Richard. I guess there's two kind of issues. <coughs> the first issue is the old walks and trails that need replacement that exist. I find it hard to believe we don't have people in our engineering department that could make the determination that needs to be repaired and what doesn't uh, in the house. The new subdivisions under the, uh, the <coughs> plan should have all the trails and sidewalks and items that are going to be built into that subdivision by the developer should be on the drawing. For example, in the southwest, I would assume we had an area structure plot 
and we'll get a development plan for that area, and it will show sidewalks and roads and trails and all these other things. Uh, if you're going into a new area, pardon me, an old area, but you want to try and, <coughs> and uh, add a trail system, it may be a little more complicated. But I don't know where that is, and I haven't seen anything on that. So what are we really buying here? Like, I'm not sure what we're buying. Uh, if we can inspect some walking trails and sidewalks without hiring a consultant, there's something wrong here. And like you say, new subdivisions, all the stuff should be included in the development plan. Uh, why would we accept the development plan and turn around and plan it all, all over again? So I don't know what the new rules are going to be, but uh, anyway, that's where I stand on this. Yeah, yeah. The document is uh, going to provide more influence on how our trail network systems work within the community and how we're looking forward to ensure we're, we're providing that mode of transportation to the residents. It's more than just looking at the sidewalk and determining whether it needs to be replaced or not, um, determining what intersections need safety crossings. Um, I think it adds value and criteria to how those intersections are managed and which ones are higher on the priority list, where are the connectivities that are lacking within our community that need to be addressed as we move forward. Um, I think it answers many of those. I, I feel like it's not just looking at the current assessment. Um, the other thing this is supposed to be integrating is our button of the park and the trail system within there, how we're managing and looking at long-term um, programs to continue to improve those trails within within the park. So there is there is more to the plan than just condition assessment or putting safety crossings in the intersections. But again, I, we can look at um, impacts of delaying this program or removing this program from our future capitalists as well. I was uh, thinking with both of the two uh, previous speakers until yesterday, sorry, Saturday, when I got cornered by a family on the north side of our city and said, how do we get to my middle park by trail? Talk about trail systems. They, they brought a good point up. I know there's been challenges in the past, and it's, it's one of those things that as we continue to look at it, just saying that she raised a very good point and said, I don't know. She says there's not a, you could come down 50, but to get to the trail on 62nd to lead you to Bunnell Park is very accessible on the north side of the track. For the residences and schools that are there to easily get to by walking or bicycle. So it, you know, it, it <coughs> that there's, a, there's some shortcomings, and maybe the master plan has that identified. I'm not sure, but I was, I was one that just jumped right out at me and not knowing this subject was going to come up today. Professor Torsen. Just to respond to that, it's within the existing transportation master plan as a medium term project. And that's what I'm saying is, even if you look at the picture in the legend, I get it's not to the level of detail, it's not picking the exact point you might want, but I just feel like in terms of connectivity and everything else, I feel like, from my perspective, it's already there. Don't throw good money in bad money or whatever the phrase is, start, I'd rather put that $150, $150 into implementing the existing transportation master plan than creating another plan. However, I understand that, you know, this is not exactly my field. This is not exactly my area of expertise. So if, if the, you know, the engineering and planning side needs this to be able to continue to do their project, then that's a different story. If they needed to be able to, then you know I'd, I'd have to uh, I'd have to defer to their expertise in this area. Um, just to me, I don't necessarily see the value. And, and even from our conversation today, I don't know if I still see it. But I am only one counselor, so I'll leave it at that. Any other comments? That uh, we can definitely take it back and have further, more in depth conversations. Um, I guess when we got the questions, we both out there, these are the responses, these are my 
our perspective that we're going back with it. If you want us to do a deeper dive into how we will manage this without the plan and when and how do we need to bring that plan forward and with future capital, we can definitely take that back and, and do that prior to the next time budget comes back for consideration and review. I don't know that you need to do that. I think we can just agree to disagree on whether or not this is important and should be in the budget. Because looking around the table, I'm not seeing a lot of, yeah, he's right. So we'll just disagree that I don't believe that this is good value. And uh, yeah, I'm not in favor of this particular project and the budget as a whole. You know, it's, it's fine. So just with that, if we decided to take this item out of the budget, maybe what repercussions or consequences there would be by not having this available. That would be more beneficial to me than perhaps proving why we need it, but just let me know what's going to happen if we take it out. What's that going to do to, what risks are we potentially going to have by doing that? We can, we can do that. Perfect, thank you. I think that's a really good question. Really good thing, Councilor. Councilor just a question to the administration. When was the last uh, uh, master, what do you call it again? Trails and sidewalk plan done. Terry's been here a lot longer than I have, but as far as I know, I don't think we've ever, we have never done a trail and sidewalk master plan within the city. We've done it. Transportation. Not so we built this whole city without a plan? No, just kidding. Yes. I want this done. Yeah. I want to have some trails on me and stuff. I don't know what you did, but just a question. I think, uh, Derek, maybe without um, if I, if I, it's been a while. It's been a while. I think it's probably the early 90s was the last time we did more of a comprehensive look at our trail network. Um, we're saying trail and sidewalk just because they're both used to. Uh, people and cyclists for the city, but the last trail run was, I think it was 93, 95, eight, somewhere out there. Neighborhood. So it's been a while. I guess your wish is a tough budget here. You, you wonder, do we need to do it this year? Like, but I, think I guess the administration is okay with it or it wouldn't be on the dock. You're right. I think Councilman Rose posed a good question back to administration. I'll bring back some comments on that. Yeah. About the, I guess that's always the question. What's the downside of not approving this project? I think that's what we need to get answered. We'll get Councilor Torres and then get Councilor Hatcher. Just so the, the date on the last report is May 2016 for the transportation master plan. But this is more of a general question. How often do we normally update our master plans? Every five years. So if we update our trail and sidewalk master plan within the transportation master plan in two years, are we going to be reviewing the connectivity and the bicycles and everything else within that master plan? That, that's something that we could take back and have a conversation about. Do we, do we maybe look at the transportation master plan and expand to include the trail and sidewalk portion of that and the gap? Um, delaying this project for maybe a year and maybe bumping our trail, our transportation master plan. We have other things going on, uh, dangerous for the roots, uh, those types of things too, so there may be opportunity for us to do that. So yeah. again, we'll take that back and, and look at it a little deeper. And with that, this is just a presumption of mine, is that when you're going through the scope of something like a trails and sidewalk master plan and the scope of a transportation master plan, when you're doing all the public consultation and everything related to it, it's going to be part of the same activity in the same groups you're talking to either way. Just something to think about. Yeah, I was going to, as, as I heard you know, on some of the questions from Councilman Monroe, the other question I had is that if we do this study, what are we going to see different next year? So is the study just going to be done for the year and then we act on it upon 2021? Or is there actually going to be some action that's going to be supported by this plan and that we have budgeted for in terms of activities? I would suggest that the more other master plan is it provides us with that direction and understanding of what our priorities are going forward with the um, with replacing existing, but also new. Um, there's been a lot of requests coming in for, for sidewalks and everything else, and that's, uh, you know, we, we did that one a couple years ago along 62nd Avenue, um, from 44th Street to um, 52nd, 
and uh, we still got some more to do there on the second, which we ran into some um, logistical legal parameters there on getting more property to be able to put more stuff in there. But it's, it's examples like that one that we really want to make sure that we, we know what they all are but, um, and what the potential costs are so that we can uh, obviously put it in front of you and, and make, and make better, um, decisions on as part of the budget process. Um, the other, other specific ones is more aligned with what the House of Bank was bringing forward was the last trail master plan where I see that fitting into the future side of things is developer X, Y, Z, whatever comes into play. Um, now he knows that he has to build a trail that suits the needs of the community as identified in the master plan versus just arbitrary picking one for their own purpose, I guess, and, and how they want to do things. They may be always be the same, but not necessarily too, right? Thank you, administration's a pretty good idea. Thank you, back for us. Thank you, Terry, for filling in the blanks. Any other questions or comments? Back to you, CFO. The next one that we were questioned on was the economic, under economic development of the intermodal transport study. Yeah, the question there was around uh, had we completed one six to eight years ago, and we, we had nothing on record that, that showed that. Dan was looking for through that report and could not find one. So uh, this one again was uh, studying the investi or investigating the use of rail in our city, and, and uh, we feel it might be an advantageous area to look at uh, from an economic development perspective. And and, uh, and just to give you an idea, last week we got an uh, opportunity from the provincial government uh, around rail and how we can. So it shows that there is some potential out there and having that, that study would, uh, would benefit. So that one's a $100,000 cost. Uh, we would look at a CARES grant, which is a provincial government grant, to fund 50% of that. So it would be 50000 50000 to we didn't get the CARES grant, we'd obviously be on the hook for the, for the entire amount. That's, uh, that's the question I was asking for how did we have one and not that we could find on record. Thank you, City Manager. Any other comments? All right, back to you, Sifu. The next one we were questioned on was the land division for a park view area, a structure plan, revisions, seventy thousand. Yeah, the question around this one was could, could we do it in house? And then we will do this one in house. However, there are a number of costs, and I think I suggested at the meeting or the last meeting that there are some costs uh, associated that our staff could provide the, the, uh, like a TIA, traffic impact assessment, uh, phase one environmental, uh, geotechnical analysis, stormwater management plan, and market study. So those are items that and when we look at area structure plans, if, depending on the size of the land you're studying, um, a cost from start could be around a quarter of a million dollars. So, so when we look at the cost of this, it's actually <clears throat> fairly minimal to update. The other thing to take into consideration is when but this one, the park view was done, uh, I'm not sure the year it was originally done, it was done as an outline plan, not as an area structure plan. So since the required, the city requirements have changed, uh, there will be a requirement to bring it up to the standard that the city has today, uh, not the way it was done back then. So, so just to make sure I'm clear on that last part, does that mean that all of Park view has to follow the standard of an area structure plan by you know, updating the usage of the handful of uh, pieces of property that you just sell to that 7 Eleven apartment buildings. I, I thought that's where the land was that was uh, being looked at. And to the south of that as well. So farther, so there'd be some further, a little bit further south of than the uh, Lakeshore Streets, the 7 Eleven. Oh, okay. Well, so so that's all the way around. around. I yeah, realize. some of the road connectivity touches in there. It's okay, close. and I think that that's a bigger area than I was thinking it was. I thought, you know, there was that high residential that was within the existing area structure plan just on the other side of, of that 7 Eleven on the south side of it. I didn't think the city owned anything past that, but that's a high memory for me. So, uh, so yeah, well, we are going to do as much as we can in house, but there are some components we want to Well, that's also a lot more land than I thought it was. So. 70,000 doesn't seem as you know, unrealistic or unreasonable based on the cost of an area structure plan now that I'm understanding that the, the parcel of lines we're looking at is the size of the chunk of, uh, compared to what I thought it was. Thank you. Okay, any other questions on that one? CFO, please can you hear me? 
The next question we have was on engineering for the 2020 water sewer replacement program construction for 1.2 million. I think we, sorry, I think we uh, talked about this. Our, our typical program is two blocks, and that the uh, project would reduce to one block for um, 2020. And that we also plan for next year's programs in this year's budget as well. So in 2020 budget, we'd be asking for funds to do the 2021 program design and gather any data based on the um, project 1.2 that's for a lot we are looking at uh, 50th Street between 53rd and 54th Avenue. Um, the entire section of 50, 50th Street from 49th to 54 needs to be replaced. It's 1940, 1948 vintage, all cast iron. Um, so all that infrastructure will need to be replaced at some point. Again, this is a one block program uh, reduced significantly from past programs. Any questions? Thank you, Tony. Uh, the next two items were together on a question for the water treatment plant, um, water treatment front end engineering design of the SCAD system and the SCAD replacement. So with regards to the front end engineering work, front end engineering is planned to be completed by engineering <coughs> to review the water system process controls. The consultant will report will review current operating philosophy, control narrative, PLC, hardware and software components, and deliver a report recommending system control upgrades in a priority ranking for those upgrades. Our total estimated engineering cost is 150000 With regards to the SCADA system improvements, um, the question was regarding why don't we just spend the $200,000 and don't do the study. Um, the $200,000 is only what we're anticipating to do in 2020. This is a uh, multi-year uh, project. We're looking at potential <coughs> Thank you. Thanks, Torsten. Yeah, I think part of that was my question, and, and the important thing to recognize that, that I understand at, at the end of that meeting is that the, the engineering portion to goods portion is an odd proportion from what we normally see, and that's mostly because we're looking to just get started on buying stuff at the end of the design process. So the, the buying more stuff will be in the future years. Exactly. Based on the full program, and cost of engineering is around that. Typical 15% off. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I understand. The last question on this section under utilities was the wastewater collection camera unit for 25000 Thank you, Your Worship. <laughs> so there were some questions regarding the need for the camera unit. Um, and one question in particular was we just <laughs> uh, two years ago. That camera was very different than the camera we're asking to purchase now. That was a pole mounted manhole slash catch basin uh, camera that they could use to, insert, to go down and do the inspections on the manholes. Um, what we're asking for is a camera to attach to our hyperback unit to, to the holes so that we can do flushing and inspections of our lead lines. Um, typically, while we don't currently have the ability to do that uh, in-house currently, that's something that if we require it, uh, we hire out to a third party. Uh, one of the initiatives, and this is tied to asset management a little bit, is doing all our main line inspections and doing condition assessments. Uh, if we were to hire a contractor to come in and do that work, um, cost is roughly about $1,000 per dollar for flushing and inspection. Um, I had our engineering team just give me a rough number of kilometers of sanitary and store pipe in the city. And currently we have around 170 kilometers of sanitary main and 
about 110 kilometers of storm gain. So when you look at rate of return, uh, if we needed to do 25 kilometers of inspection by a third party, our camera's paid for. Uh, Karen has talked about the inspection process and that um, this program has been delayed over the years because we don't have the equipment to do that and the cost to hire a contractor to come in is very expensive to do. So in order to start that program, we feel this is the best way to go about it versus having third party to do that. We do have capacity within our um, vehicles that this will be their program that they do outside of any other emergency flushes. Please hear. Right. I haven't done it for, I don't know, 
a heck of an answer. Any other questions on that one? Back to you, CFO. Can I just circle back to the fire uh, radios? Okay. Thank you, uh, CFO. Um, your Worship, I've got a response. I appreciate the fire chief and I've got a response on how they've been deployed. Uh, further, um, he advises that the current analog system is at the has added its capacity in the near end of life. Um, there's many instances where we can have difficulty in transmitting in certain areas of the city now. Um, as for the deployment strategy, um, the fire chief, deputy chief, training officer would have uh, each other radio. The uh, first one truck would have four, and he has about the same cramp that he knows, but uh, um, and the second one would have uh, three at station one and three at station two. The third alarm, station one would have five and station two would have two with two spare. And if you told the 22 radios, this will allow all the respond on the first and second which would be equipped with a radio. There's a third alarm apparatuses would be equipped with two radios coming in the area which needs three. Um, the potential, with the potential annexation, even if you were to keep the old system, um, it does not have the ability or range to keep
be proactive rather than reactive, simply to the fact that that way consequential. Yeah, Your Worship, I think when we, this was raised, it was, it was noted that these aren't off the shelf kind of items, these have to be pre ordered so that there, there's a timeline between, you know, we can't anticipate just because it goes down and we can go down to whatever business that they want for those. Uh, that, that's not the way the availability of this product works. Yeah, the, the three critical are the ones that are related to the pool side. Um, the two on the H track, uh, Nordic is under contract to provide that maintenance. Um, if those went down, they would have to come out and service those in a timely fashion. I'll just read you this the clipping from, from the agreement. The agreement applies only to the maintainable portions of the system. Repair or replacement of non maintainable parts such as ductwork, motor shell, tubes, cabinets, boiler, uh, heat exchangers, main power service, and electrical wing piping, tube, bundles, valve bodies, coils, structure supports, oil storage tanks, and other similar items are excluded from the contract. So that's straight from the contract on the not being Any other questions on that? The next question was the super crew three quarter ton lift gate and rack truck for the bio aquatic center. Uh, finance was unable to change the description, but when it comes to council, we will just change the description. Think, um, yeah, this was a three quarter ton that was changed to a half ton. I think the biggest yeah. question was do is there another fleet vehicle that can be reassigned to there? Um, I've talked to Dave Henning, our fleet manager, and all our fleet are, are deployed. We don't have any additional fleet just usable to dispatch into, into this area. Um, so it would be a new fleet request. But I think the, my initial question was why three quarter ton, I think you've answered that question. Yeah. From that perspective. So. They, they felt they transport uh, chemical from pool to pool. Um, we've done a little bit more investigation into that and from an operations perspective, we're going to work with our buildings maintenance team uh, to help with that, that transfer of the materials that's going to be needed. Excellent. Okay. Any other questions there, anyone? All right, back to you, CFO. The next item was under the Alton um, Curtain Club. And it was with regards to the second phase of the irrigation system and how it would affect the summer games. Yeah, I've confirmed with uh, both Blake and Donovan that there will be no impact to the 2020 games through the implementation of this kind of project. They would shut the project down uh, in due time prior to the games. Uh, the games would happen, then they would start the project back up. That's already been taken into account. Thanks. Any other questions there? Back to you, CFO. The next question was under was regarding the electrical controls replacement and what that all included. Yeah, so at the culture at the Lloydminster Golf and Throwing Center, um, there was a report, the building assessment done. I just have to put the there was a building assessment done in 2016 that had identified um, several electrical components that needed to be looked at and replaced. And this is one of them. So uh, the $60,000 for the electrical LPS GCC is to accomplish two items. Uh, one is to investigate the restaurant lighting and change the voltage system, voltage system. And the second is to replace receptacle and covers. Um, the project is two of five electrical projects that have been um, that have not been done at LGCC, nor in the 2016 building assessment. Uh, the report does not include timelines on where these projects should be completed. Uh, the $50,000 portion of this project is to start to understand the overloading of uh, the electrical system within the restaurant <coughs> area. Uh, the administration uh, is looking to get a better understanding of big picture issues that are going on with, with the um, electrical systems within the LGCC. Um, this is phase one of completing a multi, uh, multi electrical items that were brought up under the 20 system as well. So, so that's 
So it's more than simply plugins and receptacles. Yeah. There's some serious issues that need to be addressed. Yeah. It's not I asked that question if they're serious with regards to potential issues. My understanding is they are not. Um, they are issues we need to remediate and, and say that it's not an immediate um, risk to building or for public safety, but there are issues that we definitely need to address as we're identifying that building assessment. That's true. Thank you, Worship. So to be clear on this one, there is you know, bigger things that need to be dealt with, even on the electrical side. This is us just starting to pick away at some of those issues and doing it over multiple years. That is correct. So this is something that's been on the list there for a few years, and we haven't brought anything forward, or haven't we worked on any of the items with regards to the electrical system over the last few years. So this is our need to start looking at that program and, and getting at least one of those that we're moving forward. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? The next question was with regards to the golf carts, uh, the revenue from the golf carts and the trading opportunities. So from a finance perspective, we will follow the disposal policy for the sale and trading of the old carts and do the best to get the best return for our old assets. In reality, the impact is minimal, and the new carts are a draw from the equipment reserve and will have no impact on the tax rate. I'm not sure if the executive manager wanted to add to that. Yeah, so within the budget, um, we did budget for revenue line with regards to the trading. Um, I did talk to the fleet manager about that. He's unsure what that trading value is going to be. He wasn't sure if there was going to be any value there. Um, at the end of the day, our budget, once we go to uh, bring that back for approval, whether that's at the council level or within the administration, those revenues would be acknowledged in the actual contract of the replacement of those cards. So whether that's trade-in value or we dispose of them through our disposal, asset disposal policy, uh, there will be value uh, to those cards back on the capital project. That's great. You know, if I understand why we need the golf carts. Uh, the golf course and we're going to run it. But uh, one question I've had for several years is windshield on the carts. When it rains, the rain just comes roaring right in. And they wonder, and, and I've had several people out, can we get a piece of plexiglass up there to stop the rain when I, I don't go very much. I don't know, but hopefully it's in your budget for a, a windshield. It'll take a lot of grief away from some of us. I'm going to be honest, there's a lot of debate internally on whether which are required. Um, our plan is to buy new carts, or the new carts would come with which hills attached to them. So, yes, that is our plan. Although, if locked down, yeah, just like any other golf course, you go to most carts. Uh, yeah, that shrink wrap doesn't work, so once it starts to work, yeah. it's not going to be That's what you spend your time doing. Well, I'm a lithy counselor, I don't spend that much time golfing. They were certainly, again, it's an experience and being you know, on the back side of the golf course and having to drive through a pouring rain. Okay, any other questions? Back to you, CFO. Um, the next question was with regard to the service sports center, the roof replacement. So this one is still under investigation. Um, we have had a contractor come in and do a review. Um, we're still in the process of trying to contract the company that did the original work on that roof. Um, with the contractor that came in to assess the issues and the um, warranty within the contract, uh, when they did leave, they, they felt that that was going to be a, a hard stretch to get warranty based on his observation. Um, that, again, is still out for, for quite all review. Um, administration is also looking at different contract and, and we have talked well about contacting the contractor um, and looking at legal advice if, if that is deemed necessary. Um, in essence, the roof needs some work. Um, the cost uh, that's associated with capital is to do, I think there's two, two 
sections, uh, different elevations, it's to do both sections um, as both are experiencing leakages in, in the bedroom. Thanks, Mr. Manager Stang. I guess that's, that's always the catch-22. Do we pursue, do we start the repair while we're pursuing that? And I guess as a taxpayer, I think that we have to protect our investment today. Uh, that's just my first thoughts. And that's what I deal with. And I think most taxpayers would argue if your roof is leaking, you're going to fix it. You deal with the aftermath. And I hope the administration, as you said, is, is exploring. We know that they are exploring it. We can try and get to the end. Let's see what happens. I know what you guys can do. It's just like government grants. You can't do a thing without approval from the government grants, but in the case that it's going to be detrimental to the facility, uh, a lot of good taxpayers' money, a lot of good hard work can be donated when we go into that building. I think we, it would be beyond our shoulders not to ensure that that building's been maintained. So I appreciate that. Thanks for Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Your Worship. I guess the, the question that is that sort of bounced around in my head is more around. Um, less around this project and more around our general practice and procedures because I know in the past we've, we've gone for warranty work on, on the pavement and <coughs> the section of the pavement that were initially done on, on Highway 16 but I mean it, it should be automatic I guess in my mind and, and yet here we are asking the question about warranty and so I'm <coughs> sort of wondering how we're tying that piece off somehow so it doesn't have to be in the middle of budget we're asking whether or not we did warranty work and it's sort of <coughs> spend money or do we anticipate and get warranty and I'm sort of wondering where our practice is overall on this. Yeah, that will comments that uh, we can take back and provide further clarity on. From my perspective, just like any capital product period, there, there's a warranty period and I think it's informing staff that when they're seeing deficiencies that they're bringing them forward right away versus, you know, delay. Um, so there's some internal things we can do there to ensure we're capturing our, our full aspect of our warranty periods with any kind of project. Customer. Your Worship, I did a little checking in to try to remember what, how it all worked. But the uh, Alberta and or uh, Stroke Canadian Roof Roofing Contractors Association, uh, if, you're a certified contractor, and you belong to that association. And many architects used to demand that you belong to that if you're going to do, especially these bigger buildings. I can't say if it applies to many of I never got that far. But you paid so much into a fund and insured your roof when you built it. And five, six, seven, you only know, long term 40s, 8, 10, 15, 20 years. There is a fund sitting there to protect the owners against uh, neglect or the inability of the contractor to cover his warning obligations. And I don't know if that, how active it is, but I just got to that thing on, I think it's Thursday afternoon. But it might, <coughs> somebody will tell you, but there are, I believe, two certified roofing contractors in the city. Can maybe help you. Okay. So, the administration can take that away. Maybe you've done all that. I don't know. But <clears throat> that used to be a big thing <clears throat> on bond and roofing and stuff. No, I, I appreciate that. Certainly, we're open to whatever avenues because if we can turn over well, the stone and find 575 thousand. We can find those pretty quick. Yeah. Excellent. Any other comments? Back to you, CFO. The next question we had one that was on that Bud Miller Park um, light rewiring at the spray park, whether it's potential for warranty. Yeah, so there's some issues with the electrical system, um, in particular with regards to the lighting that's around the perimeter. Uh, our safety team did an inspection and has essentially locked that out. Um, I believe they did that last year. Um, don't have that in exact detail. Um, my understanding is there is um, a lockout currently in place, so we're not utilizing those lights. Those need to be looked at and uh, brought up to code. Uh, there's some underground lighting that are wearing that has some potential issues. Again, 
um, identified through the inspections of those facilities and to keep those to be rectified. Um, so the lighting rewiring is around 20 grand. The spray park controls is around 7,500, and the um, effects pump is 10 grand. So that's what's leading up to those the costs in that kind of project. And there is no warranty if that sounds good. That, that is my understanding. Any other questions? Um, how, how does that happen? Though? This is this new that I'm working on the work. Yeah, my, again, I'd have to. That, I'm not, I'm not trying to be you know, overly critical yeah. of what we're doing because I mean, we do a lot of projects, but it just seems that you know, we're being. Uh, I, I don't know what's happening, I guess, and that's kind of the question is that are you, should we be mad at the contractor? Should we be reviewing our processes? Or, you know, how do we unpack this in a way that um, we, we get, again, are we getting value for our dollar relative to what people give us? That's a great question. I, I think a lot of our processes have changed in the last two plus years compared to how they were managed in the past. Um, with regards to this, my, my assumption is there, the project would have went through, we would have hired a consultant, there would have been a city staff assigned to that project. Um, once project was completed, I was, I was assuming, again, I'd have to go deep into the contract to figure this out, but I'm assuming there would be a two-year warranty period where we would identify any issues in those two years. Uh, beyond that, it's our responsibility. That's, that's typically how the capital program works. So, to answer your question, we are more diligent in, in doing those inspections. We're, we're doing a better job of project tracking and project administration. So I think as we move forward, you'll see some improvements. It's how are we dealing with things that have been dealt with differently, maybe different things. Thank you. I, I did share a project with Rodney, who uh, was kind of over with us back in uh, Eastern Canada. And when we did the, the hiking trails, that went sort of on the west side of Old Rosary that went across that new development and it's kind of an open park area. But there were three areas that were literally you couldn't walk through. Uh, it was just it was water collecting three, four places. I, I gave pictures and yet I we continue to walk that area and there's no work that's done to them. And it's not passable when you know they're in the spring where it's just water collecting and in the end that pavement that's there is just gonna get it'll just it disintegrate and, and we'll be stuck with retards on it. The elevations that are used in there are they're poor. It's just not done quality work. Um, so I, mean, I, I, you know, I try to pass as long as this, and I, and I don't know how we hold our people accountable relative to the work they did deliver. And because I mean, there's what we see is that over the last couple of years, a number of projects that are actually we attempt to do. And quite frankly, the manpower available to monitor one of those, uh, I'm not sure we have available to us. Uh, and so, I mean, I, I guess that's an area that I think we need to do better on, if there was a suggestion. Sorry. No, I think you're absolutely, I think when it comes to capital money, and that's empowering administration from the city manager down, I think that, uh, ensuring that if there's any questions, we stand behind our administration to hold our contractors and our suppliers accountable to the public money that we are entrusted with as the, the city council to authorize expenditures. So, and, and I would just want to say, in fairness to the contractors, I mean, most of the contractors, yeah, do good work on the brush. So I, I don't want to take them with the brush saying that all of those people are not doing good work for us, but uh, we're no different than any other consumer out there from time to time. Stuff happens, and we have every right to say it's not done for the standard we want. And they've got the contracts as well, I think, as I actually manager said, indicated that. That's, I think there's the processes that we've done at the city, hopefully, will help to solve some of those problems because if the contract is clear and crisp, and if the council breaker, he knows that uh, if the contract's got that vagueness to it, that leaves a little bit of room for interpretation and the game starts. So you can keep it uh, as cut and dry as possible. Yeah, I think with regards to the parking trails that may be already identified by our project team and there may be some discussions with the contractor and the consultant with regards to responsibilities on those. So just just because they're not being dealt with doesn't mean the only concern is they're, they're going to be year old in the spring, and you yeah. know, they, the, the time period from 
you know, early spring we walked in and they're flooded to now. Um, yeah, so it's not it's, it's a yearly, year it's not yearly based or yearly based on yeah. years. So with our capital projects it's based on when you get final acceptance or, or uh, construction completion certificate, so that kicks in your warranty period. So if that gets delayed for two years, your warranty doesn't kick in until that certificate's provided. And then we do issue a final acceptance certificate. So that would uh, that would be after the two year period, after any deficiencies are, are repaired, uh, they would have to get that formal inspection done. So we're doing better on, on those CCCs, FACs, so those that should be captured as we move forward. And the perfect guys are going to hear all this. To get back to the Oh, some bonus. That's his bonus. <laughs> Any other comments before we move on? See you at the The next question was on a picnic shelter rehabilitation and what materials were going to be used in there to extend the life of it. Yeah, so at the end of the day, we heard what you said. That, um, we can look at alternative materials. There may be a cost of nature to that. We haven't ran any cost estimates or a difference, but the council would like to provide direction with regards to using alternative materials. We can definitely do it as a pilot project and, and see what the value is uh, for the community. So just a point of clarification, because I, I thought I knew which building we're talking about, but I'm not so sure anymore. So it's the one with the barbecue pits around it, or is it the one that's just west of the, uh, Long ball. Yeah, I'm not 100 percent sure on that. <coughs> it's been on vacation for quite some time, but uh, yeah. I can find that out for you. I am just confused about the one of the fire pit. Okay. Yeah, I, I believe it's the one. Well, there's two in there. Yeah. So, I mean, shingle work done on that one, and the other one for the I believe that's the fire pit one. Of the first one at the first entrance. So. I appreciate that. I think that is a good opportunity to bring it forward, because as council and taxpayers to see what. The indications are the costs of potential savings, if there are savings for the long term, and just make those facts out from using, and like I said, what that came to mind was just simply the tops of picnic tables using wood, which is a renewable resource, or using bioplastic bio recycled, and what that would to look like from that perspective. That's just one example that came to mind. So thank you for the update. Uh, back to you, uh, the next question was on the Bud Miller All Season Park entrance on the walking trail adjustments, design, and construction. Yeah, I think I talked about it um, at the original presentation. I can kind of read you back what I got. Uh, the project requires removal of the existing track asphalt trail located near the entrance of the Miller Hall Park and relocation of the walking trail further to the west of the original alignment. The walking trail realignment is required due to safety concerns being brought forward by residents. The concern is that vehicle entrance to Miller Park and the location of the walk walking trail reduces the existing sight lines when entering and exiting the park as well as proximity to the existing trail to Collinwood Drive. Relocating the existing walking trail further west, away from the entrance, will significantly improve sightlines and overall safety of Bed Miller Park users as pedestrians would not be crossing the park entrance once this project is complete. I, I think that's a really good idea. I think the only other thing that I can see, uh, as, as you're mentioning the park entrance, is that. If there was a speed abatement program that could help part way through there, I uh, often see uh, a lot of old guys winding up their vehicles uh, from one end to the other, other way out. Just kidding. <laughs> They're a lot younger than I am. But uh, I just think, you know, there's, you have children playing in the area, you have uh, traffic, it's intended to be a park. Uh, and if we can't, you know, supervise it with uh, legal enforcement, I think it's too expensive, just a simple speed reduction kind of plan summers down the road. And I don't know what that costs, but I, or how it fits in, but that's probably, I think, a good addition to that park, particularly on the entrance and exit. So I just want to clarify, how far to the west are you planning on moving the path? <coughs> Sorry, what was the question? I don't have the exact diameter, actually, but you still have that. 
or who's, who's got that uh, on the screen? Well, I assume it would be up to the road, right? So well, we like parallel that road. Yeah, that's right. right. I'd like to put the map up. There's a trail that comes across, yeah. so I don't. We would consider both right at where that trail is, or right at the intersection crossing. So whichever yeah. one makes the most sense from a safety perspective, that's where we'll put it. The remainder of that path would be removed. We would then remove a portion of that pathway. That's and grass and grass. Yeah. 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 Just as part of part of the path of conditions. If they get that up there, I think we can show you what the thought process is. Is there any more just bringing it up there? It's definitely needed from a safety perspective. So. <coughs> I just have a question. <clears throat> Someone might have mentioned, is there a light going in on that crosswalk at uh, 22nd Street? And there's a... Like a walking light? There's a cross oh, light on 62nd Street. You know where George goes south there? There's a crossing light across Colts Park. Yeah, right at the entrance of Bundle, there's a light going east of us. Yeah, just a pedestrian light, no, sir. It's where you cross 29th Street, yeah. And you go the swing south down 59th, or you go east towards Homer Street. But there's a crosswalk. Oh, there's a crosswalk there, yes. That's right. but I don't know, I never kept caught in the way that I did. No, no that, that state is a crosswalk, I believe, on your top of College Drive. Past. Okay. Anyway, I had it checked from last meeting and I forgot to ask. Okay. Now, people come around that corner pretty fast, <coughs> heading south, and I just wondered if it was something to consider. But sorry, I fell off track. Oh, well, that's fine. I can kind of show you after, yeah. after I show you this. Okay. Apparently, that trail comes across here. And across the inside, across the inside of the park. Mm -hmm. This comes across. So, big issues is as pedestrians are going here, if there is a pedestrian in, the vehicle sees that, and they're stopping. There's a potential issue with queuing in the short distance to College Drive, so that's that's one of the issues I talked to. Them. So the realignment would be to tie on to the trail here and bring it south. So whether we bring it south all the way to the corner and cross and come up here, or if we bring that trail across like that, that would be determined and, and obviously taken into consideration safety all those things. So you can see the overhead. Lake there, Councillor. So there's a push activated crossing at this corner. Um, but I think you were referring to um, this intersection. It's a pretty tough corner. For the yeah, there's the there's traffic lights currently at that corner, so the pedestrian crossing would be in coordination with the actual traffic. Yeah, yeah so they do have a they do have a walking lake there. Yeah, they, so they've been in for. It's in right on. So, I was going to just say, when you go back to that map at the front of us there, uh, right as that path goes along the bushes, uh, where are we at? Yeah, that, that, that clump of trees just left, 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 yeah, right right there, that, that area, just as you go further left, so you're right along those trees, that, that area is just covered in water and spring, and you can't walk through there. So, so if, if you avoided it, then you'd save the hassle of having to repair that, that pavement in there. Yeah, so however this gets connected, whatever is remaining in that piece would essentially be removed. Yeah, because it, it's all just chewed, it, it's all kind of cracked up and pushed up, so it's it's, it's super poor quality in there. Is there some root damage there as well? Maybe from you know, I, I just see the water damage, and I know that people have fixed it and done their best to repair it, but uh, it's a losing battle because the water keeps coming back in that whole area. Any other questions on the entrance? All right. Moving back to CFO. The next question we had was under the council to be determined state water input. We were asked on the West Sanitary Sewer Trunk Extension, 75th Avenue Design Review and Construction. 
Yeah, I think the question was related to can we do design now and construction later? And obviously, we have done that in the past where we've done our data engineering and put the project on, on hold. Um, there may be some implications with regards to um, how we're servicing or if we're servicing um, to the county or to Lockwood with regards to their tour as to where that that cash base would be located and where that design would be. So we can have council's direction on some of those items before we would go about design. But essentially this isn't a project, this is a project that's needed with regards to development to the west, but not necessarily needed with regards to servicing what we currently have in our property. Yeah, that's exactly. It's, 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 it's future growth. Yeah. yeah. I would also suggest that maybe, you know, part way through the year, if development is coming, we could, we could trigger that project in order to impact the tax rate. I'm assuming we could pull that from all sites to design work and stuff like that. So it'd be zero impact on the tax rate if we didn't want to push that into right forward with a simple request to council. Uh, I think that would be a good approach based on. Today we don't need the budget, we don't need to do it today, but in six months, nine months, something could change. And if it does, it's terrific, and we can adjust accordingly and go from there. CFO? The next question we have was with regard to the fire uh, station one construction, with regard to borrowing and what other funding sources were available. Um, reserves were indicated with the use and the proposed budget we indicated 3.2 million from the ca uh, council capital priority reserve towards this project and the remainder debt. However, um, when we received the confirmation of grants for 2020, uh, it could be eligible under NSF. <coughs> the debt amount could possibly be reduced. However, no impact on the 2020 tax rate at this time. Uh, it only impacts future debt payments of principal and interest. Okay. Yeah, in addition to that, I think, you know, when we, when we get the tax rate, we need to finalize what our assessment is, or there could be an additional additional money there along with the NSI confirmation. Um, hopefully at that time, we'll also have a better idea in terms of the Culture and Science Center, uh, those types of things that we may need to look at moving forward and we may be able to uh, utilize some of the dollars there as well, but at this point, the, you know, the 3.2 coming from the from our reserves is something we can do today. And it, but at the same time, we've we've impacted our reserves with this budget, you know, and, uh, more than probably we want to. And so, you know, any savings we do get to, uh, we're probably in our best interest to consider some of that money going back in reserves uh, to assist long term for some of the long term projects we've got. Any other comments or questions? I believe that's the list CFO that was raised. That is the list of questions. I'm certainly looking for your direction of how you would wish to proceed from here. Your worship, but just about yeah. additional so care and even though we don't have any real recent data with regards to CTV or CCTV camera inspections by a third party. Um, she did find some information back in 2015. Uh, we brought a uh, contractor in to do four locations as part of our capital projects, and that cost was around twenty-six thousand four hundred fifty dollars. So, um, I'll leave you yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, I realize this is a GPC meeting. So, the administration is looking for some direction as to whether our budget. Questions, I hope, uh, answered next, uh, next week if that's the wishes of the council to bring it back on the 25th before the discussion on potential uh, motion and debate. Is that uh, a reasonable expectation? I know that uh, in turn, I, I use, when I look again, Councilor Baker appreciate his, he's been at this table longer than any of us by uh, far stretch, and uh, a budget is a budget. But the budget is also open to revision. And uh, by all means, I want to reassure the taxpayers that should the factors in this 
city changed dramatically. This council was prepared, I believe, to bring the budget back. And the, but the administration is sensitive to that. And I think that's what people need to realize is it is a plan. It's a plan that we hope to deliver. And uh, if things change from a provincial government perspective, a federal government perspective, then we will readjust accordingly. We may have to take something off the table that we had planned on trying to accomplish. But uh, those can be done with that. Maintenance items, of what I call maintenance, or uh, items that we need to do to continue to uh, serve the city. At the same time, we've got some growth items. And we've got some items that, uh, if we had to, I guess we could stretch them out. They just need blowing up trucks and lawnmowers and all sorts of things because those things are the expected service that people get every day. They don't, uh, they take for granted, actually, I believe, when you see this, uh, the boulevard mode. And if this grass is three feet tall, I'm sure we would hear about it when we went to uh, deal with the tax money. So I think that from that perspective, I certainly would like to entertain the budget coming back and at least take a look at it. And, uh, See where we're at. Thank you, Richard. I didn't hear a lot around the table today. If the questions that we had uh, get an absolute no from anybody. I know there's been additional work done on the budget over this week. With that additional work and with none of these questions we had coming back going, I absolutely don't do that. Is there any change to the initial number that you gave us? in draft one of the actual tax rate, increase or decrease. You know, it's still at 2.5 if we go ahead with everything that's on that list. Thank you. So, yeah, the indication will be, at least administrative wise, it, it, it would be our recommendation that if there were some changes that we found $20,000 here, $20,000 there, then we would put that money back into our resiliency reserve. So as part of this budget, we reduced our Resiliency reserve from 700. The contribution to that resiliency reserve from 700 to 500 thousand. So we would want to. It would be our goal to replenish that. We keep that number back at 700. If we did find uh, some savings along the way, like if, uh, the nonprofit grants, as an example, which we'll talk about, to some other areas. So that would be our first goal: that we keep the the dollars where it's at, with two and a half percent, and or put it towards some of the the key capital projects that we have. Uh, on the table um, we moved, uh, in the next firewall, the cultural and science center, and the different number of projects that we got there. So it wouldn't be, even if we, if we did find some savings, it wouldn't be to bring that two and a half, unless council directed us to bring that two and a half percent down, it would be to, to uh, put it towards projects that we have uh, on the books. Any further comments? So I had one item to add to uh, just in the discussion I wanted to bring council to aware. I received a phone call Friday lunchtime that was a little different than the normal phone call. Uh, I received a call from the Prime Minister of Canada. Um, he actually returned the message I left three and a half weeks ago. Uh, it was an interesting conversation for about 20 minutes. And I'll just quickly go over what I discussed because I'm sure you're all wondering what would the Prime Minister have to say or what would I say to the Prime Minister? I appreciate Councillor Fang and I had a, just a few minutes of preparation time and uh, I reached out to Brandon Byam and uh, thank you Council, for your input and uh, suggestions. The first item I addressed with the Prime Minister was the access to markets for both our oil, natural gas, canola and wheat from this area. It's, uh, I think we all know what uh, farmers are facing and we know what the oil and gas industry is facing. Uh, the Prime Minister did make the comment that uh, moving uh, less oil by, pipe, or by rail pipeline would be beneficial to the canola and wheat market. I said, yes, I totally agreed with him on that. Um, I raised an issue about understanding who to contact. We expect a cabinet to be named early next week. And I said, uh, from the perspective as a mayor, and I'm sure I spoke uh, uh, on behalf of the city and other mayors from this perspective, was who do we go to when we have issues in Western Canada and we don't have an MP sitting on the government side. I'm familiar with the working on the wastewater treatment plant Various ministers have what they call representatives on the Western desk. And, uh, indeed, uh, someone that reports to the minister directly and uh, asks for the list to be presented with phone numbers so that we can reach out as we're dealing with the wastewater treatment plant and somebody comes up with American Canada. I need to be able to, and I think the administration needs to be able to reach out that way. I certainly mentioned our economy is part of a much larger Canadian economy. I think that's critical and that they understand that. And he certainly to understand that in this conversation. 
And uh, the concern I raised again was the energy from Western Canada does not reach Eastern Canada. And we discussed the, the former Trans Canada Pipeline proposal. Um, there's still, and as I said to him, I said, I believe there's a misunderstanding. And then we need to have a long, deep conversation with Eastern Canada uh, at all levels, including municipal, to municipal, to provincial, to provincial, and the federal to oversee that. He agreed. Now, where that goes, I'm not sure, but uh, certainly he took that in. Uh, one of the other points I raised was that uh, how oil is taxed, as I saw it, uh, from the industry's perspective, and as the mayor's chair saying that if we only get $10 a barrel for our oil, we only get to tax that oil out of the wellhead once. And if that's all we get for our product when we sell it, this goes back to the pipeline argument, uh, versus going to $40, $50, $60 for the world price, it has a significant implication. And I think the Prime Minister understands that. I really do. Uh, it's uh, brought up the, the anxiety in the community and the, the problems in both provinces from the perspective of the issues with the federal government. And I think he understood that was very well as well. Um, the, uh, we did uh, get to a discussion about a uh, trans pipeline in particular. He, uh, he advised me from politician to politician, he says, that was a very expensive pipeline. I said, yes, it was, Mr. Prime Minister. He said, I lost seats in the East because people don't want it. And I lost seats in the West because you guys want it. And I said, well, I guess you're absolutely right. So I, I, I was able to uh, see a little bit of inside on that from that perspective. So I also said, in as, as simple words as I could present to him, I, I did indicate to the Prime Minister I was going to be very direct at the front of him. I said, we have people here that want to work, Mr. Prime Minister. It's that simple. They want to go back to the work in the oil and gas industry. They want to go back into the service industry. They want to go back into the fixing trucks and fixing equipment and getting back to work. He says, that's, that's the bottom line. Our economy is in tough shape. Again, he acknowledged that and uh, said there is relief on the way. So after 20 minutes, I thank the Prime Minister for returning my phone call and uh, said that, uh, left it saying that if there's any other I issues that you'd like to chat with, I'd like to discuss them because uh, certainly having that ability to be heard gave me uh, a little bit of pause on this. I realized that he has a bunch of, we discussed the issues here of budget. I can only imagine at that level. So it was a, it was appreciated. I tried to keep it at that 25,000 foot level and stay out of the weeds of the politics because we may not always agree on various roles and responsibilities and, and the way they're going. But it was a, it was an interesting discussion and I wanted to share that with council and the community. Uh, like I say, it was, it was shocking because you often hear you say matters to Ottawa and things don't come back. But uh, I do appreciate that. So uh, I just wanted to report that to council and let them know that uh, it does well occasionally pay off to leave a voicemail. And I did, the one thing I will say to people is, what did you leave for a voicemail? I left a blank and courteous via the voicemail expressing my concern and deep concern for, for our city and uh, the issues that are going on with after the recent election. I pretty much left with that and uh, it came back. But I can uh, put a, a plug in for Mayor Charlie Clark from Saskatoon. Um, the Prime Minister had reached out to the mayor in Saskatoon right after the election, as he did with some of the other big city mayors. And Mayor Clark and our relationship with Saskatchewan, when we get the 16 mayors together at the cities of Saskatchewan, we treat each other respectfully. And he did mention that he suggested to the Prime Minister that he should reach out to some of the other mayors because Saskatoon might not be as, it's in tough, but it's not as tough as where it's in the energy industry. So I do appreciate that. So just want to bring that to Council's attention so that you're aware of what's going on. And entertain any questions or comments? When you got it, you got it. Well, this time it, the call came back. And I guess that's the, that's the important thing. Good for you. With that, I believe that we're ready to go to the inquiries for the media. Thank you, Worship. Today we have a request for yourself, Mayor Albers, Councillor Barkingham, Councillor Corson, Councillor Baker, and Councillor Baggio. All right. With that, I'll look for adjournment. No. Oh, is there adjournment? Get to the Motion to adjourn. No, Motion to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> all in favor? Oh, do I need a second? No, we're good. We're all good. Thank you.